And we're starting things off with a bang. At number 10, we have Poena Kule, also known as the, uh, the sack torture. Uh, this was used in ancient Rome on those who had committed parricide, taking the lives of your you know, own parents, which is definitely evil, but this punishment is pretty inhumane. The condemned person was first severely flogged, then they were sewn into a leather sack along with live animals like uh, a snake, a rooster, a monkey, a dog. Sometimes the sack also contained uh, other animals or objects. Now, this would already suck. Just imagine being stuck in a sack with a bunch of rowdy animals, like kicking you in the and biting you, but it gets worse. The sack was then securely fastened and thrown into a body of water like a river or the sea, causing the person and animals inside, mind you, to drown. A way to take drowning said to be one of the worst ways to go and make it 10 times worse. This punishment was not only physically brutal, but it was also symbolically significant. The mix of animals represented impurity. And the cherry on top uh, was that this was also a public spectacle. It acted as a deterrent, reminding other folks to think twice about how they acted the next time a family dinner took a wrong turn. At our number nine spot, we have what I'm just gonna call stuck to a table. This punishment was used in medieval Europe on those who attempted to take someone's life with a blade. This one is pretty simple. The perp's hand would be laid down on a table and then the criminal's own blade would be shoved through their hand, uh, straight through so that their hand was now pinned to the table. Then they had to remove their hand from the table only they couldn't use their other hand to pull the knife out. So yeah, this would have been pretty excruciating. Depending on how far the knife was into the wood, you could be pinned down to that table for a while, just pressing your injured hand harder and harder into the guard until it finally released. Uh, this is probably the tamest thing on the list too. Number eight, getting impaled. Vlad the Impaler was a big supporter of this particular method. I have a hunch that's how he got that nickname. Now, I wouldn't say his enemies were evil, but to him they were, and uh, that's all that counts, right? Vlad was responsible for a lot of deaths too. And to be fair, I'm sure at least some of them had to have been garbage. I'd heard tales about Vlad the Impaler as a kid, and I always pictured being impaled as, uh, you know, having a stake through the heart, your classic vampire trope that was inspired by this sadistic ruler's rather theatrical flair. But I later learned it was much worse than that more PG version in the movies. Vlad would impale his victims with huge spikes that would go from one end of the body all the way up inside and out the other. Usually the spike would poke right out of their mouth. Then he'd decorate the front of his castle with them as a, as a welcome to any invading forces. Uh, now that is what I call eccentric. Next up, we have the blue eagle. What would you do if a king threw your father into a pit of live snakes and watched as they smothered and, and bit him, watching him writhe in pain until he finally died? Well, if you were a Viking back in the day, you'd probably sack the whole village and inflict an even worse punishment on the man who took the life of your father. Well, in 867 AD, that man was Ayala, king of Northumbria, and his punishment was the Blood Eagle at the hands of Ivar the Boneless, son of Ragnar Lothbrok. So, here's what Ivar is said to have done to this despicable king. Ayala was, Ayala was restrained, lying face down on the ground. Then the image of an eagle with its wings spread out was carved into his back with an ax. Then each of his ribs were separated from the spine and splayed out. You can kind of start to see why this was called a blood eagle. Next, salt was rubbed into the wound and to finish off the piece, his lungs were pulled out and splayed over the exposed ribs, fluttering in the wind like a bird's wings. At our number six spot, we have the molten gold punishment. This was used in a couple different parts of the world, Rome and South America. There are a few famous examples of this taking place, but it's a corrupt Spanish governor in early colonial Ecuador who died at the hands of this horrific punishment that I'll be referring to here. In 1599, the native Hivaro tribe were being unfairly taxed during the gold trade, and they decided to see just how much this greedy governor really enjoyed his gold by pouring the molten hot metal right down the dude's throat. We've all had the experience of taking a sip of something hot before it's cooled down enough. That's just a minuscule taste of what this would be like. Even if it were just boiling water being poured down, that would probably be bad enough. But gold, this would obviously severely damage your organs, blister your lungs, it would harden inside your body. 
just completely horrific. And number five, we have immurement. This practice was done in several parts of the world throughout history, but immurement in Christendom during the medieval times is probably the most well-known. This punishment was rarely carried out, but was used as a form of religious penance or punishment with no means of escape. The victim is placed inside the confined area, which could be a tiny cell, a room, or even the wall itself, and then sealed off completely, building a wall of brick or a stone, basically building the person into the wall, cutting off all access to the outside world. Once immured, the person is left to slowly die inside this enclosed space. This would have been terrifying, similar to being buried alive, but more drawn out. At first, you'd experience a sense of isolation, then claustrophobia would set in. The lack of ventilation would then make it difficult to breathe. It would be completely quiet and pitch black. Dehydration and starvation would set in. The body would weaken. And finally, after days or even weeks of unimaginable agony, they would finally pass away. Number four, broken on the wheel. This punishment was used on thieves and back in medieval Europe. I can understand where they were coming from with the, the latter, but thievery? That's a crime deserving of something this cruel. Anyway, so what is this punishment? It's pretty simple. First, the condemned person's limbs were tied to the spokes of a large wooden wagon wheel or a similar structure. This left the person exposed to the executioner's blows. The executioner then used a heavy iron hammer or other blunt instrument to shatter the bones of the victim. If they were feeling merciful, they'd start with the neck but depending on how bad the crime was, they might draw it out longer, starting with the ankles and wrists before moving on to the more vital joints. After the bones were broken, the executioner might weave the victim's limbs through the spokes of the wheel. The wheel with the broken body attached was then often displayed on a tall pole for a public view. Sometimes the victim would die of shock or immense pain rather than the actual injuries themselves. In some cases, it would take hours or even days for the person to succumb to their injuries. Next up, we have the death of Balthazar Gerard. Oh boy, I'll just start by saying this guy's death was drunk. That gives you a pretty good idea of how cruel and unusual this punishment was. Balthazar was a 16th century hired gun, known for his role in the unaliving of William the Silent, the leader of the Dutch Revolt against Spanish rule. In 1584, Gerard shot William the Silent at close range in Delft, Netherlands. So, you know, hired gun, not a great guy, but did he deserve this? I wouldn't say so, but you know, different times, right? People thought this was brutal though, even for the time. First, he was whipped. His wounds were then smeared with honey and a goat was supposed to come out and lick it off. Uh, but the goat, even the goat was just like, nah, this is, this is messed up and I uh, just didn't want to go anywhere near him. <laughs> Following day, he had heavy weights attached to his toes and his shoes. Then he had shoes placed on him that were too small for his feet. They were oiled and then held to a fire. And as they heated up, they contracted, crushing his feet. Next, he had burning bacon fat poured on him. And this is all before he was actually finished off. It was just the buildup. Can't go into full details to what happened, uh, but finally, after multiple days, of this awful stuff going on. He was finally drawn and quartered. In its second place, we have rats. This was used on criminals back in the day as a form of cruel punishment. It was also used sometimes as a means of extracting information into the person's body. I don't think I need to do much explaining to get across just how awful this would be. Slow, agonizing, and disgusting. Quite the trifecta. And finally, we have keel hauling. Kill Hall, that filthy love. If you know what song I'm singing there, leave it in the comments. You'll get some props from me. All right, so this is uh, my worst nightmare. Other than being buried alive and everything else we've talked about on this list now, this was used by sailors back in the day to punish crew members who committed the most egregious of crimes or mutiny. As to whether these guys were evil, enough to, to deserve something like this. For the most part, probably not, but uh, here's how it would work. The sailor to be punished was tied securely with ropes, then heavy weights or sharp objects were attached to the sailor's body 
to make sure they'd sink in the water. Next, they'd be thrown overboard from one side of the ship, dragged underneath the ship's hull, and then pulled up on the other side. As the sailor was dragged under the ship, their body would be scraping and getting cut by the barnacles and sharp edges of the hull. So it wasn't just not being able to breathe that made it terrifying. Uh, this scraping could lacerate the skin, break bones. In many cases, the sailor would suffer long lasting injuries or even die from those injuries alone. And we're kicking off this list with a very grotesque one, the Sagari. Uh, this is a type of yokai, a supernatural spirit or entity in Japanese folklore, sometimes demonic in nature. Pretty much everything on this list falls under the yokai umbrella. So a Sagari is basically a ghost horse, but not the type of boring, semi-translucent ghost we often think of in the West. Things are taken up a notch here. It's said that when horses die on wooded roads and are left to rot, their spirits can get caught in the trees as they rise from their bodies. This prevents them from fully passing into the afterlife and bam, you have yourself a Sagari. By the way, if I pronounce anything wrong on this list, um I'm very sorry. Uh, let me know how it's actually pronounced down in the comments if you can. Anyway, these tree-bound spirits aren't going to do a whole lot to you, but they uh, they scare the hell out of travelers dropping down from their tree and neighing and screaming into the night as people pass. Kind of like an animatronic ghoul that pops out in a haunted house. Only here you're not really expecting to see one. Plus, a horse with its neck to, like wrapped around a tree is not something you're ever expecting to see, even in a haunted house. What a terrifying idea. Depictions of these things are just so freaky. It's just a head in this mangled mess hanging from a tree, like a demonic ornament or something. Yeah, really gnarly. Number nine, Roko Rokubi. So uh, most yokai are born the way they are. That's not the case for these ones though. These creatures begin life as normal human beings, but become Roko Rokubi after being cursed. As to why they'd be cursed, there are many reasons. Uh, maybe they did something bad or in uh, much more unfortunate cases, their husbands or fathers did something bad and these on fortunate souls are the ones who take the uh, brunt of the punishment. Roku Rokubi are strictly female. So what are these creatures? Well, during the day, they appear completely normal, uh, but when night falls and they're asleep, their necks extend to incredible lengths and then float away from their bodies, operating independently. Their head is basically uh, its own separate entity. As to what it does, it may attack small animals or just take pleasure in freaking people out. They also also really enjoy licking up lamp oil. Oftentimes, a woman who's become one of these yokai is completely unaware of it, having no memory of their head's mischief the night before. Next up, we have Nure Ona. This yokai was likely a heavy inspiration from Orochimaru from Naruto. Uh, you could find these snake-like yokai in rivers and coasts around Kyushu. Once again, these are a type of yokai, but of the more harmful variety. So far, we've looked at creatures that are just freaky, but Nure Ona consume human flesh. They look like massive sized snakes, but with the head of a woman with a ghastly serpentine features. Usually, they love yellow eyes and a forked tongue. They also have long matted black hair, always appearing to be soaking wet. Now, if you were strolling down the beach and saw a giant snake lady slithering towards you, you'd probably just turn around and then leave. But these creatures are deceptive. They'll often take the form of a normal woman, luring unsuspecting passersby to get close to them. Sometimes they'll act like they're in distress, holding what looks to be a baby. And when their prey gets close enough, they take on their true form, sinking their fangs into their target. Next on the list are the Noparabo. Uh, unsettling is the perfect word to describe them as they aren't necessarily harmful, just terrifying to look at. What's more unsettling than a faceless specter? That's what these yokai are. In pretty much every way, they appear to be normal everyday people. They're just missing a pair of eyes, a nose, and a mouth. These yokai just, they, they, they love their lives. They like playing goofs on people by scaring the crap out of them. They're often found in rural areas, mostly on the sides of roads, waiting to give hapless passers-by a fright. They'll often have their backs turned to their victim, and when the person gets too close, they'll turn around and bam, no face. Sometimes they'll actually appear to have a face and then make it disappear for dramatic effect. No parabo can also appear to be another person, making their face look like someone's friend or loved one. They just have a lot of fun being who they are. I like these guys. 
place. If I were one of them, I'd be behaving in the exact same way. Like you think if I had the ability to make my face disappear, I wouldn't use that to make myself get a laugh? I mean, come on, you can't blame them. Number six, Sharime. All right, you want unsettling? How about a yokai that has an eyeball where its anus should be? That would be unsettling to see on a human being, but the fact that it's a demonic spirit makes it even worse. Sharime literally translates to buttocks eye, so imagine that being the name of your kind. What's your heritage, Brenda? Oh, I'm actually a butt eye. Anyway, from a distance, these things look basically human, although in many tales they have no eyes, sometimes no facial features at all. Shirime don't cause any physical harm to their victims, just psychological trauma. A Shirime will usually wear a kimono, hanging out late at night on city streets. Then when a lone passerby approaches, they'll be like, uh, hey, check this out. Then drop their robe, bend over, spread the cheeks, and oh Jesus, a big glowing eyeball where his butthole should be. Hilarious to read about, anyway. Probably not as hilarious if you saw it in real life. I'd probably never be the same after an encounter like that. Actually, I'd, I'd probably still laugh. I might be a little insane, but I'd be laughing in hysterics on my deathbed. Number five, Tenome. These are really cool. So, ever seen Pan's Labyrinth? I think Guillermo del Toro had to have taken inspiration from this yokai for the Pale Man. And we all know how many bricks we dumped in our pants when that freaky monster showed up. A Tenome is an entity which appears to be an old man, only he has no eyes on his face anyway. Instead, they're on the palms of his hands. Tenome aren't just out to scare their victims either. They're incredibly dangerous, chasing after their human prey and eating them alive. They're said to be able to suck the meat right off a person's bones. They have a sharp sense of smell and can move at a decent clip. Some say that these yokai are the spirits of blind men who lost their lives in a violent manner and now roam graveyards in the dead of night as tortured, vengeful ghosts. Next on the list are Moku Mokuren. Uh, once again, these are the definition of unsettling. As they're really creepy, but in most legends they don't pose any physical threat, it's hard to describe exactly what a Moku Mokuren is. Basically, when a shoji is old and unmaintained, shoji being paper sliding doors or windows, they can get holes in them. And it's said in Japanese mythology that these holes, if not fixed, can begin to house spirits, which appear in the form of eyes that fill up these holes. As to what these eyes do, not a whole lot other than stare at you menacingly, which is a truly unnerving idea. Just imagine waking up in the middle of the night, feeling as if something is watching you. There's no one else home, at least that's what you thought. Then you look over at your old mangled sliding door to see little eyes peering at you, following you wherever you move. Number three, Hayakume. These yokai aren't particularly dangerous, just really gnarly looking. A Hayakume is a horrific looking yokai, a large fleshy abomination covered in eyes. Uh, lots of eye stuff on this list. It's a recurring theme amongst the many varieties of yokai. Hayakume translates to 100 eyes, which is a lot of eyes for one creature to have. These entities also look like mounds of melting skin. They never come out during the day, which is I'm sure many are thankful for. Uh, as the sun is too harsh on their 100 eyes. They live in shadowy places like abandoned temples, sometimes guarding these types of places from thieves. They aren't aggressive by nature. They're shy and just prefer to be alone. If a person does happen to get a little too close though, why you'd want to, I don't know. But uh, they can actually detach one of their eyes, having it fly over and land on the person, keeping an eye on them until they finally go away. Literally. In at number two, we have the Jorogumo. All right, we've talked eyeball yokai, snake-like yokai, faceless yokai, yokai in the form of mangled horse heads and trees. That covers quite an array of fears, so here's one for all you arachnophobes out there. There is a species of spider called the Jorogumo. It's said that when these spiders live particularly long, 400 years to be exact, it grows in size and gains insane powers. Imagine a moonlit night, a beautiful woman appears out of nowhere, alluring 
boring and mesmerizing. You don't realize it at first, but she's a Jarogumo in human disguise. She uses her beauty to lure unsuspecting men, and when they least expect it, she reveals her true form, a gigantic, nightmarish spider. When she has her victim ensnared, she weaves a web so strong that her poor prey is trapped, unable to move a muscle, completely at the mercy of the monstrous creature. And then, slowly and painfully, the Jarugumo sinks her venomous fangs into her prey, the venom working its way through their veins, weakening them bit by bit. She makes her victim's death slow and excruciating, drawing out the pain for as long as possible. And finally, at number one, we have Jikini Niki, uh, which translates to human eating ghosts. So yeah, the name kind of says it all. These are kind of along the same vein as the contemporary zombies we uh, know and love today. These creatures don't look all that different from human beings at first glance, anyway. They're incredibly ugly, though, and have sharp fangs. They dwell in old abandoned temples on the outskirts of villages. They don't veer too far away from civilization, though, as their food source is deceased humans, which they use their sharp teeth to peel the flesh off of. As to how these creatures come about, these are once again yokai who were born as normal people and were either cursed somehow or, for whatever reason, just took a liking to consuming human flesh, and the more they ate, the more they were corrupted until they changed, becoming one of these flesh-eating monsters. Starting off this countdown, we have the Iron Chair. Imagine the Iron Maiden, but in chair form. Basically, this was a device used in the Middle Ages. Victims were placed onto a chair that was filled with hundreds of sharp spikes. There could be anywhere from 500 to 1,500 spikes. They were strapped into the chair, and when their restraints were tightened, the spikes would dig into their flesh. And they often left the victims there for hours, even sometimes days, just suffering. Sometimes there was a hole on the seat, and then a fire was lit below them. But the most common way this chair was used for was actually psychological. The victim was often strapped in and then would have to watch another person die in front of them. It was either you confess to your crimes or you die from the chair or die another painful death like the person you saw die. This device was used until the late 1800s in Europe. And at number nine, we have the chain smoker and I'm not talking about the band here. This invention was created for those who wanted to smoke not one, not two, but 20 cigarettes at one time. That is lung cancer just waiting to happen. But it was pretty popular in the mid 20th century. So this invention was bad for a number of reasons. Number one, cigarettes can kill. Imagine smoking 20 at once. Think about what that would do to your teeth, gums, skin, and lungs. Also, think about how expensive it would be to fuel that addiction. Moving on to number seven, we have the beauty micrometer. This device was basically a way to make you feel really crappy about your appearance. So it was designed in the 1930s and was used as a beauty calibrator to see how beautiful you were and what areas needed more work. And those areas that needed work were where the makeup was applied. The machine itself looked like a medieval device with like screws and these weird strips attached to it. The machine itself was made by beautician Max Factor Sr. Yeah, yes, a man telling women how to look. Anyways, this machine is terrifying and its users would often have terrible headaches after wearing this device. Coming in at number six, we have the mass shaving machine. And this invention is exactly what it sounds like. This was popular back in the 19th century. It allowed barbers to shave 12 men at the exact same time. This device would first coat everyone's face with shaving cream or whatever they used back then. And then there was a blade hooked onto it and it would go and shave the men's face. No, just no. Everyone has different face shapes. That blade could come down and slice your face or something. I'm just glad it isn't around today. I know everyone wants efficiency, but this invention could go wrong for a number of reasons. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the flatulence filtering underwear. This one has got to be the weirdest one on this list. Basically, if you're a person that has really bad gas, don't worry, this underwear has got you covered. Basically, if you toot, the underwear somehow filters it so no odor comes out. No, I'm sorry, that's just weird as heck. Please, let's not make this a thing. Next thing you know, a company is gonna come out with like underwear that makes your farts smell like things, like 
strawberries or marshmallows. I don't need this becoming a trend, okay? Like, ooh, who has the best farts? No. Moving on to number four, we have the creeping baby. If dolls creep you out, then you would not be a fan of this invention at all. In 1871, a man named George P. Clark invented this doll baby thing. His goal was to make a doll that crawls exactly how a baby does. But boy, did it turn out really creepy. So the doll's head, arms, and legs were made out of painted plaster. From there, they were hinged onto a brass clockwork body. The doll then moves forward by rolling along on two toothed wheels. But honestly, it just looks like a creepy robot baby. So not only is this doll terrifying looking, but it can slowly creep along. Yeah, no, just no. Let's just leave it in the past, no thank you. Moving on to number two, we have the thumb screws. This was a common form of interrogation used in medieval Europe. If the criminal was not behaving or giving the information that they wanted, then they would resort to using this device. Basically, it was a vice that would clamp down on a person's thumbs or fingers. Then the vice was slowly tightened putting more and more pressure on the person's thumbs. Also, they were locked in place with a padlock, so they couldn't escape. They were left there until they made a confession. If not, their fingers were shattered. And in our number one spot, we have the head crusher. Just the sound of this invention alone is gnarly. And it's pretty self-explanatory. The device was basically a vice for the head. I know. I know, it's gross. So basically it was a metal device that hooked onto a person's jaw and then head. Then the expert would twist the handle and it would push the head and jaw together. And then you get it. I'm telling you, there were some pretty sick people back in the day. They had fun with On top of that, some versions of this device had a little thing at the front to catch the victim's eyeballs when they popped out. Mm. Yum. And we're kicking off this list with the attack of the dead men. Now, I learned about this from a song by Sabaton, awesome band, definitely check them out. But it's based on a real life battle that took place between the Germans and the Russians in World War I. On August 6, 1915, the Germans had unleashed a barrage of poison gases on the enemy before beginning their advance. They didn't think they were going to come up against much resistance if any at all, but they were wrong. From the smoke and ashes came several Russian survivors. They were coughing up blood and bits of their own lungs. Their skin had begun to decay. They looked like reanimated corpses. And the Germans immediately turned around and just booked it back where they came. They were so frightened that some of them became entangled in their own barbed wire traps. And the Russians started opening fire on the fleeing soldiers. World War I just sounded like literal hell on earth. And the Germans on that that day probably thought they were actually seeing the dead come to life. Pretty horrifying. Number nine, Destinies of the Soul. I thought uh, it was only evil books like the legendary Necronomicon that were supposedly bound in human flesh. But it turns out that this was a more common practice than you might think. Destinies of the Soul, published at some point in the 1880s, is just one of the many books that were bound in human skin back in the good old days. And where does this book sit now? Harvard. It's, it's been there since some point in the 1930s. Bound with human skin by Dr. Boland, who wrote on the inside stating, this book is bound in human skin parchment on which no ornament has been stamped to preserve its elegance. By looking carefully, you easily distinguish the pores of the skin. A book about the human soul deserved to have a human covering. I kept this piece of human skin taken from the back of a woman. It is interesting to see the different aspects that change this skin according to the method of preparation to which it is subjected. The practice of binding books this way, it was known as something I can't pronounce. Look it up there. Maybe we'll just write it. I'm not going to bother. It's going to take hours. Uh, anyway, it dates back to the 16th century. Next up, we have the Champawat Tiger. In the late 19th to early 20th century, this tigress was responsible for the deaths of an estimated 436 people in Nepal and the Kalman area of India. And that's a single-handedly, mind you. This tiger was basically the real-life version of Sher Khan. At the time, her natural habitat was being destroyed to make way for farmland and timber, and many of its natural food sources were being 
being hunted by humans in large numbers. So food was a bit scarce. And in response, the tiger decided to just uh, eat humans. And it did. Now, tigers don't often hunt down humans and eat them. But in this case, uh, she didn't really have much choice. In 1907, the rogue tiger was finally shot by Jim Corbett, an Indian-born British hunter and tracker. This tiger wasn't the only one he hunted down either. He was a colonel in the British Indian Army and was often called upon to track and slay man-eating tigers and leopards. But none were as tough as the Champawat tiger who holds the record for the highest human death toll of any single animal. Next up on the list is Terreri. Ter Terreri. He was a guy from France in the late 1700s who became famous or infamous for his super disturbing eating habits. He had this crazy appetite and would eat tons of food, even live animals. He'd, he'd gobble down a whole bunch of apples, a meal meant for like for 15 people. He'd even take to devouring cats and dogs. Terrari uh, didn't stop at regular food though. He once ate a live eel whole and even swallowed a snake after taking off its skin. Doctors and curious people began taking note of him trying to figure out like why he ate like he did. They thought something might be wrong with his stomach that made him feel full or and, and just never gain weight. At one point he was hospitalized and his disturbing behavior just got worse. He was once found eating parts corpses and drinking human blood. The mystery was never completely solved and he eventually passed away when he was 26. And at number six, we have Ancient Teeth Whitener. Now this one's just kind of gross, but if you're looking to whiten your teeth and you're on a budget, could be worth a try. Just don't say I recommended it because I am not. So uh, the Romans used to use urine to whiten their teeth. Uh, they dilute it with water or goat's milk and uh, I don't know, I guess swish it around like mouthwash. The thing, it's just, it's as nasty as it sounds. It, it did apparently work. There is ammonia in urine which acts as a cleansing agent. You can find ammonia in cleaning products like glass cleaner for example nowadays. Now I'm not sure what they would have done about their breath. Not much point in having pearly white teeth if you smell like number one. I also, it's kind of weird to think if you saw someone back then with a nice set of exceptionally bright white teeth in their mouth, you'd think like, man, that dude swishes a lot of pee. Were people like grossed out back then too? Where they're like, oh, here we go, here we go again. Gotta whiten these teeth. Things I do for these chompas. Or were they just really casual about it? I'm starting to realize why this fact wasn't brought up in school. First of all, you'd never be able to get the class under control. You know, some kid would try it as a dare. The parents would be like, what are you teaching our kids? would be a whole thing. Number five, the headless chicken. This whole incident began in 1945 in Colorado. A farmer named Lloyd Olson tried to lob off the head of one of his chickens because it was time for dinner and his wife was going to prepare a meal for his mother-in-law. Most of the head came off, but he missed the jugular and most of its brain stem was still intact. He attempted to prep the chicken for dinner, but it was still alive. So instead of trying again, he decided to just take care of it. He used an eyedropper to give it water and would feed it small bits of corn and grains. But this day would change the course of both the Olsen family and the chicken forever, as this headless bird would soon skyrocket to fame, becoming known as Mike the Headless Chicken. Together they toured the US with Mike being showcased in freak shows and circus sideshows, which I think are pretty much the same thing. He was photographed for magazines. Everyone wanted to meet Mike the Headless Chicken. Chicks wanted his autograph. He was a sensation for 18 whole months before finally dying in 1947. Next on the list we have the tapeworm diet. This was a bizarre weight loss method popular in the early 20th century, which involved intentionally ingesting a tapeworm in the hopes of shedding weight. Uh, advertisements claimed that the tapeworms would consume a portion of the food in the digestive tract, leading to weight loss without altering one's eating habits. Some people looking to lose weight could purchase tapeworm cysts, usually in the form of a pill from dubious sources. Once ingested, the tapeworms would grow and absorb nutrients from the host's Food. As they matured, the tapeworms would reach several feet in length. Weight loss was just a side effect of malnutrition and the body's like struggle to absorb nutrients effectively due to, you know, having a tapeworm in their stomach. This was obviously incredibly dangerous. There were complications including abdominal pain and 
worse stuff. In some cases, of course, life-threatening conditions if the parasites migrated to other parts of the body especially. And the tapeworms couldn't really be controlled or like selectively removed once inside the body. And eventually, medical professionals stepped in and began to denounce the tapeworm diet as very risky and ineffective. And eventually, the sale of tapeworm products uh, started to decline, thankfully. Number two, buried alive. Now, this is one a lot of you may know about already, but people used to get buried alive a lot, and not always on purpose. The, this macabre occurrence stemmed from a lack of medical understanding and limited technology. The 18th century saw a, especially a rise in cases of mistaken death due to various factors, like certain illnesses, accidents, comas especially. Medical professionals of the era really struggled to accurately determine whether someone was actually dead or not, leading to premature burials. Graveyards became the uh, unintended scenes of horror as unfortunate folks were laid to rest before they were actually dead. The fear of being buried alive was a very real concern in society at that time, which led to the invention of various safety measures to prevent people from dying in their graves, which is an odd sentence to say. Some coffins were fitted with bells or strings attached to the deceased's finger, which would be pulled from above ground in case they woke up. Then hopefully a grave digger would hear the bell and race over to uh, dig the person out. And coming in at number one, we have mummy medicine. Mummy medicine was practiced for hundreds of years and involved using ground up mummy remains in medical remedies. Uh, European apothecaries believed that powdered mummy could cure various ailments due to its perceived mystical and restorative properties. The main source of these mummies was, of course, Egypt, where preserved corpses were plentiful due to natural dehydration in the uh, dry climate. Mummies were ground into powder and added to medical concoctions, believed to treat conditions ranging from epilepsy, stomach disorders, and the demand for mummies was so high that sometimes led to the deliberate plundering of ancient Egyptian tombs. And despite this widespread use, mummy medicine lacked any real scientific basis, and over time, as medical understanding improved, the practice fell out of favor. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have lobotomies. Did you know that it used to be common practice for people to just get a part of their brain cut out? Okay, well maybe not common, but it wasn't as uncommon as you would hope. Lobotomies used to be considered an excellent and efficient cure for things such as mental health problems, which thankfully is a practice that has not survived for a very good reason. Of course, in modern medicine they do still exist, but only when actually necessary, and there is of course a lot more knowledge about the dangers and effects. One well-known person to have undergone one of these procedures was Rosemary Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's sister. She was experiencing seizures as well as mood swings, and while the seizures certainly were something that needed to be looked after for her health, I'm not sure if the mood swings necessarily needed some kind of medical intervention. Anyways, to cure her, they had a lobotomy performed on her. This procedure left her with the mental capacity of a two-year-old, and she could no longer speak or walk properly. After this, she spent most of the rest of her life hidden away, and it was thought that her family did this because they were ashamed of her, which is both horrible and so sad. In our number nine spot today, we have the English Civil War. This might be something that is taught more often in English schools, but admittedly, it's something I didn't even hear mentioned throughout my time in school. This was actually a series of civil wars that took place between 1642 and 1651, and while it is often referred to as one event, it can be divided into three separate wars. These wars were mostly in relation to the manner of England's governance as well as pertaining to religious freedoms. The first war was from 1642 to 1646, and the second was from 1648 to 1649. Both the first and second wars saw supporters of King Charles I battling against supporters of the Long Parliament. The third war took place from 1649 until 1651, and this one saw the supporters of King Charles II fighting against the supporters of the Rump Parliament. In the end, these wars saw the ex of King Charles I, the exile of his son King Charles II, and the replacement of the English monarchy with the Commonwealth of England. There's so much more information about what went on and who was fighting in these wars, but I unfortunately don't have time to cover all of it in the short amount of time we have, but it certainly was a revolutionary period for England, Scotland, and Ireland, and it really was concerned with how these three kingdoms should be governed. In our number 8 spot today we have William the Conqueror. This one is a bit more well known than some of the others on the 
this list today, but I want to specifically talk about one thing in reference to this that is much less well known. In 1807, William the Conqueror decided to take on an all alcohol diet. This is because he was suffering from extreme obesity and was struggling because of that fact. Because of this, he told his staff that he would only drink wine until his weight went down, but he ended up passing away less than a year later, and most of us are told that this was obviously because of the wine only diet. But that's not actually true. In an astonishing turn of events, this wine only diet actually worked. Shortly after beginning his diet, he was able to ride his horse again, which was one of the main reasons he started the diet in the first place, as he was previously too heavy for the horse to carry. He actually died after falling from his horse during an expedition, which was completely unrelated to either his weight or his diet. It's entirely possible that had he not gone on this diet, he would have never ridden his horse and maybe would have lived longer. Truth Hopefully who knows, but I suppose in a very roundabout way he did still kind of die from this wine only diet. In our number 7 spot today we have the World War 2 dogs. A lot of us have learned quite a bit about World War 2 as it affected everyone at the time and was obviously a huge deal. We all have slightly different perspectives on it depending where you grew up and went to school, but it's something that is still widely talked about today. There is so much to cover on this topic so of course some of it ends up getting left out of the history textbooks, but that doesn't mean the knowledge doesn't doesn't survive in some capacity. For today's list I want to talk about a technique that was used in Russia during World War II that ended up completely backfiring. In Russia they had trained dogs with bombs strapped onto their backs to run under tanks. I'd like to think that this technique also saw the dog being able to leave the bomb there so that they could escape, but that is most likely wishful thinking, but that isn't even what I wanted to talk about today. While this is I suppose a good tactic for fighting a war, there was one grave oversight during this training. All the dogs were of course trained using Russian tanks, since that's where and who they were being trained by, so when it came time for the real deal, these dogs couldn't differentiate between a Russian tank or an enemy tank, which then saw the dogs running under what they knew, which were the Russian tanks. Certainly not the outcome that they were expecting. In our number 6 spot today we have Mary Shelley. We all know Mary Shelley as the author of Frankenstein, but there's one super creepy and kind of sad thing about her that is much less well known. Mary his husband was a man named Percy and when he was 29 years old he was sailing with two other men and on July 8th, 1822 they got caught up in a storm and ended up drowning. The bodies of the men were found 10 days later and they were only able to be identified based on their clothing. This of course is extremely tragic and sad and of course it would have been so awful for Mary to have to lose her husband at all, let alone in this way. Percy ended up being cremated and for some reason his heart was the only part of his body that refused to burn, which I guess Yes, now physicians suggest was due to calcification from an earlier bout with tuberculosis. While this in itself is pretty freaky, at first Percy's friend Lee Hunter ended up keeping his heart, but later it was turned over to Mary. Instead of disposing of the heart or doing anything normal with it, Mary ended up keeping the heart and she carried it with her for years. No one knew about this odd little keepsake until a year after her death when it was found in the drawer of her desk, wrapped up in the pages of one of his last poems. What a simultaneously heartbreakingly beautiful, but also ultra creepy story. The heart ended up being buried in the family vault with Percy and Mary's son after he passed away in 1889. In our number 4 spot today we have the Chilean Civil War. Just to throw another war into the mix today, let's talk about the Chilean Civil War of 1891. The short of it on this war is that the president at the time, Jose Manuel Balmaceda, tried to give himself a lot more power than he probably should have had. The congress weren't exactly thrilled about that, so they and the Chilean Navy rebelled against the president and the army. The Navy made the smart move by going north and seizing the nitrate mines, which were very economically important. From there, they sailed south. Like any war, there of course was a lot that went on, but ultimately the Navy and Congress were successful and victorious. This war was actually the first war where modern torpedoes were used and were actually successful, although it took all of the torpedoes they had in just one attack. Part of the reason the Navy was so successful in this war because not only were they able to dominate on land, but also sea. This really led other countries to realize how vital it was for them to have modern ships and naval defenses. It also made other countries realize how important it was for them to have modern weapons. This war may be lesser known and less discussed, but it certainly was an eye opener for a lot of other countries. In our number 3 spot today we have King Gojian of Yue. King Gojian of Yue had his reign from 496 BC until 465. 
5 BC. His reign took place during what was arguably the last major conflict of the spring and autumn period, and he was able to lead his state to victory, but it certainly wasn't an easy road or without some very creepy happenings. The major conflict he led his state through was the war between Wu and Yue, which started when a Yue princess, who was married to a prince of Wu, left her husband and fled back to Yue. I mean, this of course wasn't the only thing that caused the war, but it certainly sparked the fire. King Gojian was an extremely humble king as he wouldn't relish in the riches he had as most royals would. Instead, he ate the same food as peasants and often would leave himself hungry in order to remember that he was in a position to serve his state. Okay, so you might be sitting there wondering when I'm going to get to the scary historical event that you came to this video for, so here it is. As I mentioned before, he was able to lead his state to victory, but of course a war involves a lot of sacrifice and some pretty horrific happenings. King Gojian's army was very well known for their ability to scare their enemies before battle began, and this is because their frontline consisted of criminals who had been sentenced to death. In this time, there wasn't lethal injection or the electric chair, so naturally it was a lot more of a vicious process. These criminals would decapitate themselves in front of the enemy army. Yep. I think this is probably the definition of a scary historical event. I can't even imagine witnessing something like that and then having to proceed with a battle against the army that has people doing that sort of thing. King Gojian was certainly not a leader who was wasting time messing around. In our number two spot today, we have Topsy the elephant. Topsy was a female Asian elephant who was born in Southeast Asia around 1875. She was secretly brought into the United States shortly after and was unfortunately added to a circus who advertised her as the first elephant born in the US, despite that obviously not being true. During her 25 years with the circus, she gained a reputation as a bad elephant, and after she ended up killing a guest at the circus, she was sold to Coney Island's Sea Lion Park in 1902. The Sea Lion Park was eventually sold and renamed to Luna Park, and during Topsy's time here, she was involved in quite a few highly publicized incidents, which could be attributed to her drunken handler, the publicity hungry owners of the circus, as well as the fact that this is all a perfect example of why animals that belong in the wild should be in the wild. In the end, all of the horrible people who had a hand in Topsy being in this circus decided that since she was such a problem, they would execute her publicly. They were going to hang her, but because people thought that that was inhumane, they decided to take a different route. For the record, I just want to say that the of Topsy was inhumane no matter what method they chose, because Topsy didn't deserve to be in this kind of an environment. On January 4th of 1903, Topsy was fed carrots that were laced with potassium cyanide, and she was also electrocuted and strangled. To make this horrific day even worse, the event was both spectated and the Edison Manufacturing Movie Company was there to film the whole thing. Many people believe Thomas Edison was actually there himself, but that is something that is up for debate. This whole situation is absolutely hard heartbreaking, and Topsy deserved a lot better than everything she had to go through. In our number one spot today, we have the Red Summer. The Red Summer is something I didn't even hear mentioned in school, which is honestly absolutely shocking. I'm hoping this is something that is more commonly taught than I think it is, because it certainly is very important. The Red Summer is the term used to refer to the period from the late winter through to the early autumn of 1919, in which white supremacists terror and racial riots took place in more than three dozen cities across America. Some of the more well-known race riots that took place during the Red Summer were the Chicago and Washington DC riots, and the Red Summer also saw the Elaine that took place in Elaine, Arkansas, which saw the deaths of between 100 to 240 black Americans. These anti-black riots are said to have developed from a multitude of post-World War I tensions, such as the economic slump and the competition in job and housing markets. In 1919, it certainly wasn't uncommon for there to be race riots and a multitude of white-on-black violence, but the Red Summer really marked some of the first race riots in which black people in number stood up to the white supremacy, resisted, and fought back. During the Red Summer, a civil rights activist named A. Philip Randolph publicly defended the right of black people to self-defense. It is said that between January 1st and September 14th of 1919, white mobs lynched at least 43 black Americans, but despite this, the states refused to interfere or prosecute these mobs. Considering how many race riots went on during this summer, we truly could dedicate an entire video to the Red Summer. It is insane to think about how recent 1919 really was 
And while we certainly have come a long way, there is always more work to be done. And part of the work involves us learning about these horrible histories and what happened in our past. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Quincy Allen. Quincy Allen is a man who went on a crime spree between July and August of 2002, where he took the lives of four people. His crime spree was actually inspired while he was in prison, serving time for stealing a vehicle. It was here that a fellow inmate decided to start recruiting others and told him that he could get Quincy a job as a mafia hitman. When Quincy was released, he decided to buy a shotgun so he could start practicing. Man, I really wish he showed this kind of dedication to literally anything else. Quincy started off this horrific crime spree on July 7th, 2002 by attacking a 51-year-old homeless man who was sleeping at the time. Luckily, this man was able to survive the attack. His crimes continued until he was arrested on August 14th, 2002. After his arrest and trial, Quincy received a sentence of death and is still on death row awaiting his sentencing did not deter him from the criminal life, however, as in 2009, Quincy, along with another inmate, planned an attack on a correctional officer at the prison they both reside at. Quincy was intended to be executed on January 8, 2010, but there was a stay of execution that was accepted, and as of July 26, 2022, literally just over a month ago, Quincy's death sentence was overturned. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Golden State Killer. The Golden State Killer is one of the most famous serial killers of all time, and he managed to elude police for 30 years. From 1973 to 1986, the GSK was responsible for taking the lives of 13 people, harming 50, and 120 different burglaries all across California. Throughout the investigation process, he used different tactics to both taunt and threaten police and victims, which is just another level of being messed up. If you don't know how this story ends, buckle up though, because it is wild. So you know those like family DNA tests, like 23andMe, where you send in your DNA and then they send you back your genealogy. Well, basically, these kinds of services helped identify who the real Golden State Killer was. In 2018, when Detective Paul Holes and FBI lawyer Steve Kramer uploaded the Golden State Killer DNA profile, which they were able to obtain from the crime scenes, to the website GED Match, they were able to find 10 to 20 people who had the same great, great, great grandparents as this DNA match. From there, a genealogist made a large family tree and then they were were able to single out two main suspects. After covertly collecting DNA samples from one of the suspects and comparing them to the crime scene DNA, they were finally able to arrest Joseph James D'Angelo, who is the Golden State Killer. After decades of waiting, the victims of his crimes were finally able to see justice served as he was sentenced to 12 life sentences plus eight years. He was spared the death penalty because he admitted to numerous crimes he had perpetrated, some of which he wasn't even being charged for. He is now 75 years old and will definitely spend the rest of his life in prison. In our number eight spot today, we have David Berkowitz. David Berkowitz, or the son of Sam, is an American serial killer who terrorized New York from July of 1976 to July of 1977. He took the lives of six people and wounded seven others, all while eluding the biggest manhunt in New York City history. He was one of those arrogant ones who leaves like little notes for the police, promising to do it again. But his arrogant self was caught for his crimes and he was arrested on August 10th, 1977 and was indicted for his crimes. He confessed to all of them and claimed that he was just obeying the orders of a demon that had manifested itself in the form of a dog that belonged to his neighbor. He was found mentally competent to stand trial and he pleaded guilty to his crimes, which left him sentenced to six consecutive life sentences. He later admitted to making up the dog story, which like, yeah, duh, but he did say that he was a member of a violent satanic cult and his crimes were committed as a part of that. These claims were investigated, but no one has ever been able to confirm or deny them. In our number seven spot today, we have Tex Watson. Tex Watson was one of the central members of the Manson family, which was led by Charles Manson, and he was a willing participant for the horrible Tate and LaBianca crimes that took place on August 9th and 10th, 1969. In October of 1969, Tex knew his arrest was coming, so he fled to his home state of Texas, but was later arrested and extradited back to California. Once he was in California, he refused to to talk or eat and ended up losing 55 pounds, which got him sent to get tested to see if he was fit to stand trial, which he was. In 1971, he was convicted on seven counts of first degree unalive and one count of conspiracy to commit unalive. He originally received a death sentence, but it ended up being commuted to life in prison. Get this, you guys, though, he was able to release a book while in prison and he got married and through conjugal visits, he was able to have four 
children. Four children. But thankfully in 1996 they banned those kinds of visits for people serving life in prison and in 2003 he got divorced because his wife had met someone else. Like. I hope so. In our number six spot today, we have Scott Erskine. Early in life, Scott began to commit violent crimes against others that I truly cannot even speak about here on YouTube, they're so bad. He spent four years in prison for one of these crimes when he was around 17 years old, but when he was paroled after the four years, he immediately began committing crimes again. In 1993, Scott invited a woman who was waiting for the bus into his home and ended up holding her hostage for several days. After letting her go, he was quickly arrested and ended up being sentenced to 70 years in prison. This is when he had to submit DNA to a database, and in March of 2001, that DNA was matched when the cold cases of the unsolved killings of Jonathan Sellers and Charlie Kiever were reopened. In 2004, a jury sentenced him to death, and six days later, he was transferred to San Quentin. In an interesting turn of events, Scott did die on death row, but it wasn't due to a scheduled execution. Scott died a couple of years ago in July of 2020 after contracting. 19. In our number 5 spot today we have Charles Ng. Charles' story starts off shortly after he moved to the United States on a student visa. He dropped out after his first semester and soon after he was involved in a hit and run accident. He then tried to avoid prosecution by enlisting in the United States Marine Corps using false documents that stated his birthplace was within the United States. He was arrested by military police a year later for stealing automatic weapons and then somehow he escaped custody, headed back toward Northern California, and this is where he met Leonard Lake who is another real piece of work. Charles did end up going away and serving a bit of time, but it was only 18 months and he was back with Leonard, and that is when the two started their crime spree. It is believed that together the pair took the lives of somewhere from 11 to 25 different people. When Leonard was caught and brought in for questioning, he sneakily took a cyanide pill he had hidden in his jacket and took his own life, but Charles ended up standing trial. He was convicted for 11 of the killings and he remains on death row at San Quentin. In our number four spot today, we have Sean great. Sean is a serial committed a series of crimes from 2006 until he was apprehended in 2016. Throughout his decade of criminal activity, it is thought that he took the lives of at least five people. So basically, his story is a little confusing, but in September of 2016, Sean was arrested and later indicted for two killings, as well as a kidnapping, and harming a woman whose 911 call actually led to his arrest. At the same time, in another county next door, he was also being charged with two other deaths, as well as another one from all the way back in 2016. This final count from all of those years ago was actually an unsolved Jane Doe case who had been unidentified for 12 years. When Sean confessed to this crime, he wasn't even sure who she was, he just said he believed her name was Dana. On May 7th, 2018, Sean was convicted on two of the counts, and on March 1st, 2019, he pleaded guilty to two of the others, and on September 11th, 2019, he pleaded guilty to the additional count. In the end, he was sentenced to death and has remained on death row since that final plea and sentencing, and he is currently scheduled to be in 2025. In our number three spot today, we have the Zodiac Killer. This one had to make it on this list because while there are a plethora of terrifying people on this list, nothing is as terrifying as an uncaught serial killer and the Zodiac is definitely the most prolific of them all. The Zodiac Killer took the lives of five people in the San Francisco Bay Area between 1968 and October of 1969. He was most known for targeting young couples or a lone male cab driver. Despite two people luckily and thankfully escaping his attempted evil doings, he has still never been caught. While no one has heard from the Zodiac since 1974, the case remains active in many different counties, and maybe one day we'll finally know who the real Zodiac is. In our number two spot today, we have Dale Hausner, and Samuel Dietman. Known as the serial sh the crimes these guys committed are definitely on the list of fears I have, which I'm pretty sure spawned from a Criminal Minds episode. These two were actively committing these crimes between May of 2005 and August of 2006. Basically, they were arsonists who would randomly set fire to objects, but they would also drive around and commit random drive-by shootings. That's the really scary part. The fire thing is also bad, don't get me wrong. There's just something about completely random violence that absolutely terrifies me. In the end, a series of tips is what led investigators to identify the perpetrators of these horrible crimes. In particular, one from a friend of Samuel who explained that Sam had actually confessed to some of the killings one night while drinking. In Dale's trial, he was found guilty of 80 out of the 87 felony charges that were brought forth, and that was all in one single trial. In the end, he was sentenced to death six times, and his brother, who was later found out to have assisted in some of the crimes, was sentenced to 25 years. Samuel was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In our number one spot today, we have The Doodler. While this nickname sounds 
sounds very sweet, it, like everything else on this list, is very sinister. The nickname that this unidentified killer received is due to his practice of sketching his victims before taking their lives. This unidentified killer committed their crimes in the San Francisco area from January of 1974 to September of 1975, and they specifically targeted gay men. It is believed that 14 deaths can be attributed to this killer, while three others were injured in the process. Unfortunately, because of the stigma and sensitivity surrounding gay men at the time, the three who survived this monster were very reluctant when speaking with the authorities for fear of being outed as a result of it. This has led to there being very little information for them to work with in terms of identifying the man responsible. For a while, there was a primary suspect, but that person has never been officially charged because sadly, none of the survivors felt comfortable enough to testify in court. And we're kicking off the list today with the haunting of the Ammons family. There was a lot going on with this case. It's similar to some of the stuff Ed and Lorraine dealt with, but it would have terrified them for sure. This whole situation played out back in 2011, and it became one of the most well-documented possession slash haunting cases in recent years. Latoya Ammons and her family moved into a rental house in Gary, Indiana, where they soon began experiencing terrifying and inexplicable paranormal events. The family reported hearing footsteps, creaking floors, and voices, especially during the nights when the house was quiet. That's your, your more standard spooky haunted house stuff, but even crazier, the young ones allegedly started levitating, floating above their beds or being thrown across the room by some unseen force. Latoya and her children also began displaying signs of possession. They were speaking in deep voices, growling and demonstrating unnatural strength and aggression. The house was also infested with the flies, even during the winter months. Several witnesses, healthcare professionals, social workers, and even police officers who filed official reports stating that they had witnessed unusual and unexplained phenomena in the house, so like, it doesn't seem like this was just the family spouting stuff off. Number 9, the Kamuki House. This is said to be one of the most haunted houses in Hawaii. In 1941, police responded to a frantic phone call from a woman screaming about her family being attacked. Authorities rushed to the scene, and when they got there, they reported seeing a young boy. His three sisters and their mother, who made the phone call, being tossed around by a seemingly invisible force. A similar horrific incident would happen in the home 30 years later, which police would also report on. Luckily, the home has since been torn down. Condos sit on the property now. As to what was responsible for these odd cases, local legend has it that there was a vengeful corpse that had been buried on the property. Next up, we have the S.K. Pierce Mansion. The house was built in 1875 by Sylvester Knowlton Pierce, a wealthy chair manufacturer. It changed ownership multiple times, but everyone who lived there seemed to have a real lousy time. The home served various purposes. At one point, it was a boarding house, a hotel, a restaurant, and during all this time, as ownership changed hands and people moved in and out, some residents never left. The ghosts. In 1965, the home was owned by Ennio Sari, a World War II vet who met his end after being burned alive in his bedroom. The cause of the fire? Not 100% certain. His bed just seemed to mysteriously catch fire. People who would visit that same room later on would often describe the faint smell of something burning. A couple by the name of Edwin Gonzalez and Lillian Otero moved into the home in 2009, and they were only able to stay in the place for two years. They had a list of creepy experiences, but it was actually their neighbors who would tell them about this next thing. The folks next door would look out their window on occasion and see a little blonde haired boy running through the couple's house. Edward and Lillian didn't have kids. The couple would also report seeing a woman believed to be Mrs. Pierce and a young child, possibly her daughter. They'd also hear unexplained voices and whispers and conversations in seemingly empty rooms. And at number seven is the Lizzie Borden House. The Lizzie Borden House, located in Fall River, Massachusetts, is infamous for the brutal death of Andrew and Abby Borden that occurred there in 1892. On August 4th, 1892, Andrew and Abby Borden were found dead in their home. Lizzie Borden, Andrew's daughter, was accused of the attack but was acquitted during her trial. The case remains unsolved, and the true identity of the perp has never been 
definitively proven. Guests claim to have seen apparitions of Lizzie Borden and her parents throughout the house. Some have reported seeing the figures of a man and woman believed to be Andrew and Abby Borden in different rooms. And number six, we have the Michael Taylor possession. We've heard of some cases where exorcism supposedly worked, but there are a lot more that failed, or in this case, ended in total tragedy. There's a good chance this man was far beyond anything Ed and Lorraine Warren would have been able to deal with. The Michael Taylor possession case, which occurred in Osset, England in 1974, is one of the most disturbing exorcism cases in recent years. Michael Taylor was a 31-year-old married man with five children. He started experiencing behavioral changes in erratic episodes, exhibiting signs of aggression while claiming to be tormented by evil spirits. He was part of a local Christian group called the Christian Fellowship Group, led by Mary Robinson and her husband, Pastor Ray Robinson. The Robinsons and other members of the Christian Fellowship Group decided to conduct an exorcism on Michael that ended up lasting for an entire night. Taylor displayed violent behavior. He would attack the participants participants. He would growl, speak in tongues. After the prolonged exorcism sessions, Taylor was declared free of the demonic entities by the group. But shortly after returning home, he ended up taking the life of his wife, Christine, in a frenzied attack. When police arrived at the scene, they found Taylor covered in red, strolling down the streets in a completely detached state. Taylor ended up being acquitted on the grounds of insanity and was sent to a psychiatric hospital for treatment, which is what should have happened long before. Number five, the Haunted Elsa doll. Now, the Warrens were no strangers when it came to haunted dolls, but after having dealt with Annabelle, I doubt they'd have wanted any part in this. In 2013, the Madonia family in Houston got an Elsa doll from Frozen for their young daughter. It would sing and say phrases from the movie. Everything was pretty normal for the first two years, but according to their mother, Emily Madonia, the doll started to go back and forth between English and Spanish, just out of nowhere. There was no button for it, just completely random. They had the doll all the way up until 2019, and during this whole time, they never even had to change the doll's batteries. And the creepiest part, Elsa would occasionally say phrases even when its power was switched off. Family did what anyone would do in this situation. They chucked Elsa in the trash, but weeks later, they found her in the basement. They attempted to get rid of the doll again, putting the doll in the trash all the way at the bottom of the bin right before the garbage was collected for the day. Then they left town for a few days, but when they got back, guess who was sitting in their backyard? Elsa had returned yet again. Now, the most logical explanation is that someone was playing a prank. According to the mother, though, the doll was taken away by the garbage men, and the, and the doll in the backyard had a distinctive mark that her daughter had left on it years before, so it seemed to be the same one. I'm not gonna accuse the dad, but all I know is, I, I know what I'd do if my family was freaked out by a doll and wanted to get rid of it, uh, so. I'd probably have some fun, anyway. At number four, we have the Hopskinville Goblin Encounter. Goblins, you know, you don't hear about many real life goblin encounters. Unfortunately, this is just another alien encounter case. Ah, oh, la di da. Anyway, not sure how Goblin uh, became part of the name. In August of 1955 in Hopskinville, Kentucky, the Sutton and Taylor families witnessed strange lights streaking across the sky. Later that night, they heard odd noises outside of the farmhouse, including scratching, tapping, and footsteps on the roof. The situation took a even more bizarre turn when the families spotted small, silver-skinned beings about two to three feet tall with large glowing eyes, long arms, and sharp claws. Terrified, they fired at the creatures, but the bullets seemed to have no effect, so the families called the police who found no evidence of intruders. They ended up going to the police station and, and recounted their experience. Next up, we have the Bell Witch. The story goes that in rural Tennessee, back between 1817 and 1821, the Bell family, John Bell, his wife Lucy, and their children, came under attack by an unseen aggressive entity. The Bells lived in a settlement called Red River near Adams, Tennessee. 
The strange occurrences began in 1817 when the family reported hearing unexplained knocking on the walls of their home. And over time, these noises escalated into worse things. Whatever this entity was, it started interacting with the family, speaking to them, and even causing physical harm. It became known as the Bell Witch. Apparently, it had a very distinctive voice, but it could also mimic the voices of other people. Jean Bell, in particular, suffered physical attacks from the entity. He experienced choking, slapping, pinching, spanking, which contributed to his uh, declining health. One theory is that the Bell Witch was connected to a neighbor named Kate Batts. She was involved in a property dispute with the Bell family and was thought to be responsible for the supernatural events. John's health deteriorated rapidly and eventually he passed away in 1820. The Bell Witch was said to have taken credit for his death, claiming to have poisoned him. And after John's death, things eventually died down. No pun intended. At number two, we have the Germana Cell Possession. Clara Germana Cell was a 16-year-old South African girl attending a Roman Catholic mission school. In 1906, she started exhibiting s disturbing behavior. She would speak in languages she had seemingly never learned, Polish, German, and French. She would also show aversion to sacred objects and symbols. Witnesses reported that Clara exhibited superhuman strength during her episodes, overpowering multiple people trying to restrain her. Clara reacted violently to religious symbols, crosses, holy water, prayers, leading many to believe that she had been possessed by some sort of dark force. The local Catholic priest, Father Erasmus Horner, was called to investigate Clara's condition. After witnessing her behavior and conducting interviews, he became convinced that Clara was possessed by a malevolent entity. Several exorcism attempts were made on Clara. The exorcisms were performed by Father Erasmus Horner and a team of priests. After this series of exorcisms, first few didn't really take, Clara was reported to have finally been freed from this demonic possession, and she apparently returned to a normal state with no memory of the events that had transpired during her possession. Finally, though, we have Huska Castle. This place is said to be a full-on gateway to hell. Forget about ghosts murmuring in the night or slamming doors. Here there are said to be full-on winged demonic monsters lurking in the shadows. In the Czech countryside sits Huska Castle. It was built in the second half of the 13th century, sitting over an incredibly deep pit in the ground. The strange thing about the castle is that it sits in the middle of nowhere. There's no water source nearby, no trade route. It wasn't built in any strategically advantageous place. So what was this castle built for? Well, it all has to do with the giant hole. It sits on top of a hole that is said to be a gateway to hell. Before Huska Castle was erected, locals would report strange phenomena surrounding the pit. Wigged monsters were said to fly forth from its depths. And it was so deep that nobody could see the bottom. You'd have to be lowered down to see what was in there. And one story goes that a man did volunteer to check things out. And whatever he saw turned his hair gray and made him lose his mind. So Huska Castle was built, fortress built, not to keep invaders out, but to keep demonic forces in. The place is so notorious that back in World War II, members of the SS were said to perform dark rituals at the castle, which sounds like pure fiction until you read about how into the occult they actually were. So that's not that surprising. Starting us off at number 10 is divorce. Well, today you can pretty much get a divorce for, well, really any reason you want. That wasn't always the case. In fact, prior to being able to file over irreconcilable differences like most couples do now, now, pretty much only men were allowed to divorce their wives, not the other way around. Unless that is, the wife could prove her husband's impotence. As it was seen as a woman's legal duty to bestow a child to her husband, if he couldn't give her the goods per se, she could file for an annulment of the marriage. But how did the court go about proving this, you ask? Well, of course they couldn't just take the woman's word for it, so they would bring in a witness, usually a worker to try and arouse the man. That or the court would enter your marital bedroom and well, you know, see for themselves just how well the man could get the job done. If he did in fact have any issues completing his manly duties, the woman could be freed of the marriage. Just be careful they don't accuse you of becoming a witch. Next up at number 9 is man-made fertilizer. The Battle of Waterloo in 1815 resulted in the death of an estimated 60,000 soldiers, but not many of these 
bones have ever been recovered. And the reason why is pretty grim. In a strange, twisted series of events, the English decided to clear the field of the corpses and put the bones to use in a rather effective, but albeit creepy way. Newspapers of the time reported that the fallen French army were ground up in Yorkshire factories and the bone dust was added to their manure. Apparently the oil from the marrow proved especially helpful in the grave robbing turned fertilizer plan, and the fertilizer was purchased by farmers across England and scattered widely to help grow their crops. Meaning that an entire generation of England ate food made possible with the help of dead French soldiers. Coming in at number 8 is Ching Shi Huang. Before the understanding of modern science, there was a lot of ideas about elixirs and remedies that have quite literally no logic to back them up. Now of course, it wasn't their fault. They truthfully didn't know any better. But looking back, that doesn't make it any less wild. The first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, was one of the many intent on finding the elixir of immortality, and so he demanded his royal doctors find this magical potion for him, otherwise he would have them killed. I mean, just real low stakes stuff. Eventually, likely under the duress of not wanting to be killed, and also probably not knowing what they were doing, they offered him a magic potion that they promised would bring him eternal life. The magic potion, however, was actually just mercury, and the emperor ended up dying from poisoning himself. A bit ironic that in the pursuit of eternal life, he actually only made his life shorter. Coming in at number 7 is Henry Rathbone. During school, we all learn about John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated President Lincoln at the Ford's Theatre in Washington. But did you know that that wasn't the only tragedy to occur due to that night's events? In the theatre with Lincoln that night was his wife, along with Henry Rathbone, a military officer, and his girlfriend Clara. At the time of the assassination, Rathbone saw Booth and tried to save Lincoln, but Booth stabbed him before he could reach the president. Although he physically survived the attack, he left with a deep-seated guilt about not being able to save the president's life. Two years went by, and and despite trying to move on from the tragedy by marrying Clara and starting a family, his mind never fully recovered and he became more and more paranoid about the world around him. He began claiming to hear voices speak to him from behind the walls that would taunt him endlessly, until eventually they pushed him towards complete breakdown. Convinced it was the only option, Rathbone shot and killed his wife before stabbing himself in an attempt to take his own. But just like before, he survived the attack on himself. Eventually he was tried for killing his wife and sent to live the rest of his life in an asylum. Coming in at number 6 is an animal trial. So not only did they have trials over the impotence of a man, believe it or not, you could also take a literal animal to court in the Middle Ages. I kid you not. The whole kitten caboodle would be present. A judge, prosecutor, witnesses, a defense attorney. They truly took it very seriously. The reasoning behind it all, I suppose, was that at the time, law prohibited punishment without trial. For for everything and everyone. The first recorded instance was the prosecution of a pig in France in 1266 accused of eating a young boy. The pig was found guilty for his crime and executed as punishment. If that doesn't sound crazy enough, keep in mind the judge would hold the behavior of the accused animal against it. And if the court didn't feel the animal was acting properly, that was taken into account. These trials were only put on against domestic animals as they truly believed having been in the company of humans, they should know how to act. Now, not all animals were executed for their crimes. Some lesser criminals were merely excommunicated from the church or cursed and sent to live in the wild. But it's still crazy. I mean, honestly, I wish I was making this up. Coming in at number 5 is John Scott Harrison. Raised by the ninth president of the US, William Henry, and the father of the 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison, although John Scott himself never rose to presidential ranks, he did served two years in Congress and was a prominent political figure in his time. But one day he decided politics wasn't really for him anymore and spent his last 20 years managing a farm in Ohio. After his death in 1878, his family gathered for the service and took great pains to protect his grave. At the time, grave robbing was at an all-time peak due to the demand for cadavers in medical schools. To avoid having his father be another subject of this, Benjamin had an unusually deep grave made and placed a massive stone that required 16 men to move placed on top of his casket. For extra measure, he then covered the whole ordeal in cement, then 
placed small wooden pegs below the surface of the covering so that he could tell if it had been disturbed. Oh, and he hired a security guard to watch it day and night for the next 30 days. After noticing a nearby family friend's grave had been exhumed, Benjamin and his nephew went to go and track it down. They managed to obtain a warrant for the Medical College of Ohio and with the help of a detective went to retrieve the corpse of their dear friend. When they arrived, they found a dissecting room on the top floor, but to their surprise, they couldn't find who they were looking for. Instead, they happened upon a body that looked strangely familiar, and when they removed the rags covering the head, they were horrified to discover it was the corpse of one Mr. John Scott Harrison. How the grave robber managed, we will never know. Next up at number Number four is La Custa. The Pax Romana is known for being one of the most peaceful times in history. The Romans had pretty much conquered what they set out to, and so they began to, you know, just chill out for a bit. Then along came La Custa, esteemed maker of poisons and the world's first cereal. Well, more like a hired assassin by the Roman Empire. Locusta was routinely caught poisoning people, and despite frequent arrests for her killings, was always let free. Why is that? Well, the Empire got word and decided they could use her to their advantage. Her first big gig came from Empress Agrippina to kill her husband, Emperor Claudius. Locusta complied with glee and assassinated the Emperor. However, soon after, Agrippina threw her under the bus for the crime. But now, under the ruling of Lord Nero, he saved her for his own devilish plots. For the next 15 years under Nero, she worked consistently and was even awarded for her service. Locusta received a villa and even even a small staff to help her in her poisonous endeavors. Nero even went as far to provide her with her own school for the profession. But after Nero was sentenced to death, Locusta lost her security blanket and lawful immunity and was by the emperor for her crimes. Coming in at number two is virginity tests. Back in a time when a woman was merely the property of her husband, there was one very important thing that needed to be assured before the wedding night, that she was pure. Mostly because it was believed that the consummation in fact kind of sealed the whole husband owning his wife deal, and if she had done it with anyone else, she didn't really belong to him. Charming. So to ensure that their potential wife was worth the dowry, suitors would perform virginity tests on their brides to be to make sure they weren't getting a secondhand woman, if you will. Such tests included inspecting their urine, as it was believed a virgin's urine would be clear. Other times they would give the woman a special potion, and if she could refrain from peeing, she was a virgin, as if a bladder was any indication of that. Sometimes a physician would be hired to inspect the woman's downstairs area, as they believed they could literally just tell by looking at it. Most common though was to inspect the sheets after the marriage was consummated. If there was blood, hooray, a virgin. If not, well then it was assumed she was a liar and her husband was legally entitled to compensation for being swindled into marrying her. And last up today are syphilis zombies. Sometimes it's easy to forget just how much antibiotics have changed the world around us. While nowadays a shot of penicillin can keep an early onset of the STI at bay, back in the day it could quite literally be the end of you. In fact, in 1494, Italy experienced one of the worst outbreaks in history, and if you didn't know any better, you might have thought it was a zombie apocalypse. Of course, before there was any kind of real understanding about how these types of diseases could be spread or caught, people were, let's just say, having a lot of fun with each other. But on the flip side of that, if they caught the infection, it would cause flesh to literally dissolve off their bodies until their inevitable death within a few months. It was also widely believed that bedding a virgin could cure you of the disease, so that's fun. Apparently, it was not uncommon to witness people missing hands, feet, eyes, noses, or look as if they'd been dropped into a vat of acid while walking down the street. Also remember that it took a few months before the disease actually killed them, so they were just living in excruciating pain while their flesh was slowly eaten away, in some cases right down to the bone. With that image in mind, it does make a little bit more sense as to why they believed you would go to hell for premarital relations? Like, I kind of get why they thought it was the devil punishing you for your sins. Thank God for antibiotics. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Rhode Island Vampire. Admittedly, witch and vampire hunts aren't exactly a topic covered in most history classes, but this is truly a pretty crazy story. In the late 1800s, tuberculosis was spreading pretty rapidly in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Vermont. This obviously would have been pretty terrifying for the residents of these places, but things quickly took a very dark turn. 
Since many of the people who were passing away from this illness appeared very obviously ill with sunken, drained faces, for some reason, the logical response was that people believed that they had been the prey of vampires. There was a family in Exeter, Rhode Island that had multiple people pass away from the illness, so some people believed that someone in this family must be the feeding vampire. They even went as far as to exhume the bodies of some of the deceased family members to make sure that they weren't undead. One of the exhumed bodies had passed away more recently, so her body was in better condition, which people of course took as a sign of her being a vampire. This led to them burning her heart and liver, and then they mixed the ashes with water. This is most definitely a crime today and pretty scary, but to make things even worse, they gave this concoction to other people in the town who had fallen ill as some kind of a cure. Imagine having to drink that and then still having tuberculosis after. Definitely not a good trade-off. In our number eight spot today, we have the Acadian Expulsion. This is something that happened in my own country, you guys, and I can honestly say this was never taught at the schools I attended. The Acadians were descendants of the 17th and 18th century French settlers who settled in the area that is now the Canadian Maritimes, so New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. In 1730, Acadians had to swear to British authorities that they would remain neutral on any conflict between Britain and France. Basically, one thing led to another, and the governor of Nova Scotia at the time, Charles Lawrence, saw the Acadians as some kind of a threat, and he also wondered why people who weren't from the area were allowed to live on such a beautiful part of the land. Well, isn't that real rich coming from someone who also wasn't from the area, but that is a whole separate conversation. Charles tried to force the Acadians to take an unqualified oath of allegiance to Britain, and when they refused, he imprisoned them and then ordered them to be deported. A man from New England called Charles Morris came up with the disgusting idea to surround the Acadian churches on a Sunday morning and capture as many people as possible while also burning their houses and crops. This whole situation led to approximately 10,000 Acadians being deported, and apparently this whole ordeal had a fatality rate of 53% for the Acadians. This whole thing is honestly pretty disgraceful, and it's just something that we don't talk about. In our number seven spot today, we have the Iranian Revolution of 1979. On August 19th, 1978, at the Cinema Rex in Abadan, Iran, there were hundreds of people watching a film when four men barricaded the doors, doused the cinema in gasoline, and lit the whole thing ablaze. This was a key event that led to the following revolution of 1979, but it truthfully had been building for quite some time, and this obviously wasn't the only event that led to this movement. This revolution was unique in the fact that it lacked a lot of the usual causes, such as a defeat in war, or a gigantic national debt, or an uprising of those in poverty. There is a lot that happened and a lot that went into this revolution, and I truly do not have time to cover in this video even half of it. But this revolution not only toppled Iran's absolute monarch, but it had worldwide political repercussions that are still seen today. In our number six spot today, we have Cyrus the Great. It is entirely possible that you may have learned about Cyrus the Great in school as he was the founder of the Achaemenid Empire, but there is one thing he did that apparently a lot of us didn't know that possibly changed the course of our history. After he took Babylon over, he freed all of the captured slaves in the city and let them go back to their homelands. This included the Hebrews who were captured and enslaved from Judea. This may seem like a nice and reasonable thing to do, but it truly was more than that. By allowing these people to be free and return to their homes and continue practicing their religions, this may have been what has kept some religions alive. Without this move, it is possible that we may not have Judaism, Christianity, or Islam today, and that would have made our entire history very, very different. In our number five spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known for development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense considering the word Renaissance literally means rebirth. But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't widely talked about. Sailors who had been returning from the New World at this point brought something less than lovely back with them, and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the Great Pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin or banana medicine back then, the disease spread rapidly and the symptoms were pretty gruesome. 
It would often happen that a person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away, which would leave large ulcers. Some people's noses and lips would be pretty much gone, and it happened often that people would sadly pass away from the disease. So basically what we think of as a beautiful time in Europe was both world changing, but also very scary and like pretty close to a zombie apocalypse. In our number four spot today, we have the history of dentures. I suppose this one is less of an event and more of a weird practice, but I just had to include it. I don't have a ton of experience with dentures, but they seem to be a pretty straightforward thing these days, aside from the cost of dental, but things weren't always the way they are today. Instead of dentures being made of fake teeth, before they used to be made with real human teeth, which is absolutely disgusting to me. After the Battle of Waterloo, scavengers went and took the teeth off of the corpses, which is quite a job, and then they sold these teeth to dentists. These dentists would boil the teeth, chop the roots off, and then attach these teeth to ivory base plates and then sell them to the customers. Aside from this being an extremely morally questionable practice in its entirety, it is also just so creepy. In our number three spot today, we have telephone cats. If you're a cat person, you might want to skip over this number. In 1929, two scientists at Princeton University wanted to conduct an experiment in order to test how auditory nerves perceive sounds. This is obviously extremely important research, but the way they went about this is truly messed up. They took a sedated but alive cat and cut out a part of its brain. They then attached one end of a telephone wire to the cat's auditory nerve and then the other end to a telephone receiver. When one of these scientists spoke into the cat's ear, the other one could hear it on the other end. This is cool, but most definitely not an excuse to do something so inhumane. There were of course benefits to this experiment and it is believed that this may have helped lead to the development of cochlear implants, which is of course an incredibly important scientific advancement. The worst part, however, while the cat actually survived this experiment, instead of treating it like a king for the rest of its life, like it truly deserved, these scientists instead decided to kill it to see if the experiment would still work on a dead cat. It didn't. In our number two spot today, we have the smallpox pandemic. I'm sure at some point or another, most of us learned about smallpox and the epidemic, which is something that we luckily don't really have to worry about much anymore. But one thing a lot of people explained that they didn't know was how badly it devastated indigenous peoples. Europeans who came over to America brought with them a multitude of diseases that they would have had some immunity to, considering it was likely their bodies had encountered it before. But this was not the case for those already living on the land that is now referred to as North America. Indigenous Americans not only had no immunity towards this disease, but also their traditional ways of treating illness may have only exacerbated the symptoms. Because of course, how could you possibly know how to treat something that you've never seen before and with no help from the people who actually do know? It has been estimated that the spread of this disease caused the population of Indigenous Americans to decline by 70%. That is absolutely insane. There's a theory that this spread of disease may have been one of the only things that led to the colonization of North America. In our number one spot today, we have the Tulsa this is one that many people, including people from Tulsa, explained that they didn't really learn much about in school. This event occurred on May 31st and June 1st of 1921, and it has actually been called the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. This happened in the Greenwood district of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and basically just mobs of white racist people went out and attacked black residents and businesses. What started this was when a 19 year old black man named Dick Roland was accused of harming a 17 year old white girl and he was subsequently arrested and there were rumors that he was going to be lynched. This of course drew a bunch of racist white people out of their homes to participate, but then a group of around 75 black men also showed up to make sure that he didn't get lynched. One thing led to another and a firefight broke out that led to 10 of the white people and two of the black people being killed. After this, all hell broke loose. Just last year, the last living survivor survivor of the R&B and jazz saxophonist Hal Singer passed away at the age of 100. And just last year, this finally became a part of the Oklahoma State curriculum, and it's about time. Only a century too late. I also feel like in that I didn't include, but I should have said, that 
thing after the lynching was like only the beginning of it and then everything got crazy and way, way, way more people died and it was really destructive. I just didn't want anyone to think that I was making it seem like it wasn't as bad as it was because it really, really was. Coming in at number 10 is Nikolai Yezhov. Nikolai Yezhov was a Soviet secret police officer under, including at the height of the Great Purge. He organized mass arrests, tormented and executed then he fell from Stalin's good graces. He was arrested and subsequently admitting in a confession to a range of anti-Soviet activity, including unfounded arrests during the purge. He was in 1940 along with others who were blamed for the purge. Now Nikolai wasn't only ousted, executed and disgraced along with his family, he was then methodically erased from photographs where he had previously appeared with his commander. Overnight Nikolai went from one of the highest officers in a powerful new world order to a shadow in a poorly lit photo and a name and no one dared to utter. Now Nikolai wasn't the only person to receive this photoshop treatment as it was common in the communist government to deny failures and make inconvenient truths even people disappear. Now the practice has continued in current communist led governments where rebellious leaders are removed by force and deleted from official documents. Coming in at number 9 is Delphine LaLaurie. Delphine LaLaurie was a sadistic serial slayer socialite who lived in New Orleans. On April 10, 1834, a fire broke out in her mansion's kitchen and firefighters found a 70 year old black woman chained to the stove. Now she appeared to have started the fire in order to attract outside attention while Delphine was trying to save her furniture. Now the authorities were led by other slaves to the attic and they were shocked. Disfigured and maimed slaves were chained to the walls or floors. Several had been subjects to medical experiments, most likely performed by her husband who was a doctor. One man appeared to be part of some bizarre change. A woman was trapped in a small cage with her limbs broken and reset to look like a crab and another woman with arms and legs removed and patches of her flesh sliced off in a circular motion to resemble a caterpillar. There were claims that an elderly man had his face so beaten it was indistinguishable and one woman had her back wounded to the point where her bones were visible. Some had their mouths sewn shut and starved to death, others had their hands sewn to different body parts and most were found dead and the remaining that were alive were begging to die to be released from the unbearable pain. Now LaLaurie and her husband fled by boat before she could be brought to justice, leaving the butler who also participated to face the wrath of a mob that had gathered outside. Number 8. Zhang Qing. Zhang Qing was a Chinese communist revolutionary, actress, and major political figure during the Cultural Revolution. She was the fourth wife of Mao Zedong, the chairman of the Communist Party and paramount leader of China. Now, Zhang was best known for playing a major role in the Cultural Revolution and forming the radical political alliance known as the Gang of Four. Through clever maneuvering, she managed to reach the highest position of power within the Communist Party, just short of being president. It is believed that she was the main driving force behind China's Cultural Revolution, of which she was the deputy director. Now, During the Cultural Revolution, much economic activity was halted and countless ancient buildings, artifacts, antiques, books, and paintings were destroyed by Red Guards. Millions of people in China reportedly had their human rights annulled during this time, and millions more were also forcibly displaced. Estimates of the death toll of civilians and Red Guards from various Western and Eastern sources are about 500,000 in the true years of chaos of 1966 to 1966. 1969, but some estimate as high as 3 million deaths, with 36 million being prosecuted. Number 7. Jang Song Tech Jang Song Tech was the uncle of the current dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong Un. He was more focused on following in the ways of his brother, Kim Jong Il, something that the new dictator didn't agree with. Now, at the beginning of his rule, Kim Jong Un was still considered quite young for his political position, and some of his choices were questionable at best. Seeing that his uncle didn't agree with him, he had him tr tried by a special military tribunal and executed by a firing squad. Now, after his Kim ordered all media outlets within North Korea to remove any sort of record of him, and that included any sort of pictures or information from history books. Number 6. Peter Burnett 
Peter Burnett was an American politician who served as the first elected governor of California from December 20th, 1849 to January 9th, 1851. Now in 1848, he moved to California during the height of the California Gold Rush. He was appointed to serve on the Supreme Court of California, and even though he had enslaved two people, to make California a slave state, instead pushing for a total exclusion of African Americans in California. Governor Peter signed into the law the so-called Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, which enabled the enslavement of native Californians and contributed to their genocide. He declared in an 1851 speech that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate the results but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power and wisdom of man to avert. Now efforts by federal negotiators to preserve some native land rights were fought by the administration of Peter who favored the elimination of California's indigenous peoples. Now he also passed the Foreign Miners Act which taxed only Chinese and Mexicans, deliberately designed to drive them out of the gold fields. Now a wave of violence against them took place before and after. Number 5. H. H. Holmes H. H. Holmes was a con artist who liked to take the lives of people. Until his in 1896, he chose a career of crime, including insurance fraud, three to four illegal marriages, horse theft, and ending the lives of many. He claimed to have ended the lives of 27 people before he was arrested, tried, and executed. He constructed a hotel of horrors, later known as the Mer Castle to target guests visiting the Windy City during the 1893 World Fair. Now, the building was equipped with soundproof rooms and had gas lines that could be used to asphyxiate guests. It also had trap doors and a secret series of tunnels that Holmes could use to, to spirit away their bodies, which he was believed to have dissected and sold. Now, in the basement were a dissecting table, stretching rack, and industrial oven. On May 7th, 1896, Holmes was and in 2017, amid allegations that Holmes had in fact escaped, his body was exhumed for testing. Due to his coffin being contained in cement, his body was found not to have decomposed normally. His clothes were almost perfectly preserved and his mustache was found to be intact. Now his body was positively identified by his teeth as being that of Holmes and he was then reburied. Number 3. General Yahya Khan General Yahya Khan was a Pakistani military officer who served as the third president of Pakistan from 1969 to 1971. Now he also served as the commander in chief of the Pakistan army from 1966 to 1971. Now along with Tika Khan, he is considered the chief architect of the 1971 Bangladesh genocide. Yahya Khan's presidency oversaw marital law by suspending the constitution in 1969. Holding the country's first general election in 1970, he delayed the power of transition and in March 1971, Khan ordered Operation Searchlight in an effort to suppress Bengali nationalism. This led to the Bangladesh Liberation War in March 1971. Now Khan was central to the perpetration of Bangladesh in which around 300,000 to 3 million Bengalis died and between 200,000 to 400,000 women were taken advantage of. In December 1971, Pakistan carried out preemptive strikes against the Bengali allied Indian army, culminating the start of the Third Indian Pakistan War. Now, this the wars resulted in the surrender of Pakistan and East Pakistan seceded as Bangladesh. After Pakistan's surrender, Khan resigned from the military command and transferred the presidency. Khan's short regime is regarded as the leading cause of the breakup of Pakistan. He is viewed negatively in both Bangladesh, being considered the chief architect of genocide and in Pakistan. Number two, Pol Pot. Pol Pot was a Cambodian revolutionary, dictator, and politician who ruled Cambodia as the prime minister of Democrat Kapuchea between 1976 and 1979. He was a leading member of Cambodia's communist movement, the Khmer Rouge, from 1963 to 1997 and served as general secretary of the Communist Party of Kamchia from 1963 to 1981. Now, his administration converted Cambodia into a one party communist state and perpetrated the Cambodian genocide. Pot planted to turn Cambodia into a simple, agrarian, and socialist society. He forced the urban population, such as teachers, doctors, and other professionals, into the countryside, onto collective farms, and asked anyone who complained or broke rules by a pickaxe. There was more than 150 detention centers for any dissidents. S21, the most notorious one, had seven survivors out of 20,000. Others were taken to fields. 
and buried in mass graves. Now he also outlawed religion, most reading, money, anything private, and strictly governed sexual relations, vocabulary, and clothing. Out of a country of not even 10 million people, it's estimated up to 3 million people died in just 3 years. Number 1. Queen Ravanaloa Queen Ravanaloa was known as the Mad Queen of Madagascar, and I feel like that explains a lot. She finally ascended to the throne on August 4th, 1829, where she immediately took out all her rivals. She had expelled the European merchants, teachers, diplomats, and trade deals with Britain and France were immediately cancelled. After one successful battle against an invasion, she slit the heads of Europeans, stuck them on pikes, and lined them in the beaches. Now She also banned the teachings of Christianity and she had many evil techniques to punish people as her descendants and criminals would be dumped slowly in boiling water or oil or tied down with ropes and burned alive. She would place others into coffins and some were buried into holes with dirt showered upon them. She sold her subjects into slavery to boost her country's economy, which involved brutal labor conditions, staying far away from homes, and malnutrition related deaths. Now, These people were either considered traitors, victims of war, non-taxpayers, or Christians who secretly practiced their religion. Her reign brought down the nation's population from 5 million to 2.5 million at the end of her rule. Next up at number 8, stained glass. If you walk into just about any old church, you'll notice the walls are decorated with beautiful stained glass. But what might surprise you is that in some of the particularly older pieces, there is a strange ingredient that helps it all come together. In 1112, a German monk wrote about the process of creating the beautifully colored glass, and as he detailed, it starts off innocently enough, adding sand and potash at a high temp until it becomes molten. From there, they'd add a stabilizer before coloring the glass with different metallic oxides like copper, cobalt, and gold. But once the glass was cooled and shaped, the small details were added by paint. They made the paint usually from lead or copper and would then suspend it in urine. So, quite literally, some of those old stained glass windows were painted painted with pea paint, which I mean kind of just makes me giggle if I'm honest, but it is definitely a weird ingredient to think about being in paint. Next up at number 6, Minnie Dean. Wilhelmina Dean, or Minnie as she was often referred to, was a nanny in New Zealand during 1880 and was a well-known caretaker in her town. But something was off with the woman and soon she began having quite the dark spot on her name and career. In 1889, one of the young people under her care suddenly died, as if out of nowhere, and initially it was viewed as a freak accident, but two years later, the same thing happened again. Now with two minors perished under her care, police decided to investigate further into the matter. After a bit of sleuthing, it was concluded that under Minnie's care, the two minors were as she was attempting to take out life insurance on them. Police immediately took the remaining young boy in her care, finding it in dirty clothes and drinking curdled milk. By 1895, the investigation into her crimes continued and she was spotted trying to flee on a train with another victim in her arms. And when police searched her house, they found three more covered up victims. Eventually found guilty for all her crimes, she was the first and only woman ever hanged in New Zealand. Next up at number 5. Radiation test subject. In 1999, a man named Hisachi Uchi was a power plant technician and he became known for being exposed to the highest amount of radiation of any human in history. While working at the Tokamura nuclear power plant, after a lack of safety protocols, improper training, and just an overall pressure to meet deadlines, Uchi and his co-workers made a terrible error. They mistakenly mixed an incorrect measurement of radioactive materials into the wrong tank. And as you've probably figured out, it caused a near fatal burst of gamma rays. Hisashi, who happened to be the closest to the incident, was brutally injured and sent to the hospital. Once he was there, it was discovered he had no more white blood cells, so essentially meaning that he had no remaining immune system. And despite being in intense pain with a rapidly deteriorating condition, doctors kept him alive under the family's request. So for 83 days, Uchi remained alive, being used as a test subject for experimental radiation treatment by the doctors, which, I mean, in their defense was the request of the family, but still, he endured several cardiac arrests, lost all of his skin, and suffered brain 
brain damage as well as organ failure. One of the last things Uchi ever said was, quote, I can't take it anymore, I'm not a guinea pig. And then finally, one more cardiac arrest released him from his Coming in at number three, James Jameson. One of the heirs to the Jameson whiskey family fortune, Jameson considered himself to be an adventurer of sorts and often traveled to far off lands detailing the trips in his diary. In 1888, Jameson decided to head out to explore the Congo, and while there he wrote about and demanded some gruesome things from the locals. So before beginning this expedition, Jameson discovered that the area he was visiting was known to have a population that participated in the eating of other humans. Apparently Jameson set out to witness it firsthand, which I mean, why was that his dream? A little suspicious if you ask me, but I digress. <laughs> According to Asad Faran, who was his translator for the trip, Jameson bought a girl from a trader of slaves for a few handkerchiefs and gave her over to the tribe to be eaten. Allegedly, he didn't pay the tribe directly, but in a roundabout way, he did sort of pay to have this girl c What's even more gross is that he proceeded to draw and paint watercolors of the gruesome event while it happened. Which again, just wrong on so many levels. Coming in at number two, Cambodian Barbies. You may have been taught about the Khmer Rouge in history class, but if they don't ring a bell, essentially they were an extreme communist regime in Cambodia that held government between 1975 to 1979. They were known for being extremely cruel and committed some of the most horrifying acts of history, with nearly 2 million perishing under their ruling. Now, during their radical rule, the entire country was isolated from all foreign influences. This included closing schools, hospitals, factories, banks, foreign agriculture. They believed this would stimulate the rebirth of the country, but of course, all it did was send it into desolate famine and poverty. Led by a man named Pol Pot, the people of the country could not forage for food, despite the fact that everyone was starving. And any Anyone who disobeyed the orders was killed. Apparently, as the people became more and more desperate, they began to turn to folk magic, turning Barbie dolls into smoking talismans for luck. Thankfully, since its dissolution in 1999, all the leaders have been jailed for their atrocities, and the people are freed from the regime. And last up in our number one spot, the Rabbit Woman. Her name was Mary Toft, and in 1726, she became known throughout Surrey, England, as having been the woman who gave birth to rabbits. Now, I know what you're thinking, that isn't possible. And you would be right. But still, the story of how she convinced people it was real was crazy. Apparently, Toft was actually pregnant at one point, but miscarried, and it could have been this that sent her into her madness. Toft began declaring that she was giving birth to various animal parts, and so her local doctor became involved in the case. At first, everyone actually believed her, as in fact, a rabbit did, well, come out of her. And with a doctor backing up her claims, the king and his royal surgeon got involved. Unlike her local doctor, the king's surgeon was skeptical, and after discovering corn inside the stomach of one of the rabbits and hay in their droppings, it proved the animal hadn't developed inside Mary. Eventually, Mary Toft admitted to the hoax and explained that she had manually inserted the animals inside her to make the delivery as realistic as possible. She was immediately imprisoned for fraud, and the medical community was ridiculed for having been fooled. And we're starting off the list with Unit 731, and it's human experimentation. Unit 731 was a covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit of the Imperial Japanese Army during World War II. Operating in Japanese occupied China, particularly in the Pingfang district of Harbin, Unit 731 conducted inhumane experiments on thousands of Chinese, Korean, and other prisoners of war, as well as civilians, including women and young ones. The unit was responsible for numerous atrocities. They conducted experiments to study the effects of biological weapons, such as anthrax, plague, and cholera on human subjects. Prisoners were infected with these deadly diseases to observe their progression and develop methods of contagion. Often subjected to dissection without anesthesia, they were also exposed to freezing temperatures to observe the effects 
effects of frostbite. Some experiments involved forcing victims to stand barefoot in the snow until their limbs froze, allowing researchers to study the gangrene that followed. Researchers also tested various weapons like bombs and flamethrowers on live human subjects to observe their effectiveness and impact on the human body. Some prisoners were tied to stakes and used as targets for grenades and other explosives to study the effects of shrapnel wounds. This is just the tip of the iceberg too. The things carried out here were absolutely nightmarish. In at number 9, we have human zoos. These were actually just what they sound like. You'd think human zoos are something out of like a science fiction movie or something. Humans being held in captivity and observed in their quote unquote natural habitat by aliens. But this really was a thing right here on earth. There was a human zoo right in Coney Island. Human zoos existed shockingly up until the 1930s, possibly even further than that. Really not that long ago. Human zoos were public exhibits of people, typically from non-western cultures, displayed in a zoo-like environment during the 19th and early 20th centuries. These uh, exhibits were part of colonial ex exhibitions and world's fairs in Europe and North America. These zoos were made to emphasize the belief in the cultural and racial superiority of Europeans over non-European people at the time. People from various indigenous cultures and ethnic groups, Africans, Native Americans, Asians, Pacific Islanders, they were often brought to these exhibitions. They were made to live in mock natural habitats, perform dances and ceremonies and regular daily activities, all within the confines of a designated exhibit area. Exhibits were often accompanied by posters and pamphlets and educational displays, reinforcing these very stereotypical and misconceptions about the exhibited cultures. Pretty wild stuff. Next on the list we have the Radium Girls. The term Radium Girl refers to female factory workers who were employed by the United States Radium Corporation in New Jersey and the Radium Dial Company in Illinois in 1917 to about 1926. These workers were responsible for painting watch dials with a luminous paint containing radium. What they weren't told at the time is that radium Radium is incredibly toxic. These workers were tasked with using small brushes to paint radium based paint onto watch and clock dials to create precise markings. They were often told to shake the brush using their lips and tongues so that they'd have a more kind of sharp tip. So they were just ingesting radium on a regular basis. Over time, many of the radium girls began to experience some serious health problems, anemia, bone fractures, necrosis of the jaw. They also developed various cancers. As these health issues started coming to light, some of the women uh, sought legal action against the companies. In the 1920s, several workers filed lawsuits against the USRC and Radium Dial Company for negligence and demanding compensation for their suffering. In the end, this case played a big role in the types of safety standards we have in workplaces today. Number seven, the Kalavrita Massacre. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Most of you have probably heard of the Massacre in Aradour sur Glen, France by SS soldiers. Well, stuff just like that was happening all the time in World War II, and this incident was very similar, but much less known, at least outside of Greece. This massacre occurred during World War II in December of 1943. It was a brutal event carried out by German forces in retaliation for the Greek resistance activities against the Axis occupation in Greece. During the German occupation of Greece, the Greek resistance movement actively fought against these German forces. In response to the resistance activities, the SS targeted civilians, especially in small towns and villages, as a means of punishment. And they just wanted to send out a message. On December 13, 1943, German troops, part of the 117th Jaeger Division, surrounded the town of Kaliverta in the Peloponnese region of Greece. The soldiers systematically destroyed the town and its surrounding villages. Men, women, and children were gathered in the town square. The Germans separated the men from the women. The men were while the women and young ones were locked inside a school building, which was then set on fire. Those who attempted to escape the burning building were 
by the German forces. Some women and children managed to escape though. One German soldier couldn't stand it anymore and opened a door allowing some prisoners to flee. The soldier was later punished by death. After the war, some uh, of the responsible German officers were tried for war crimes, but most of them escaped justice and some were never even identified. Next on the list we have the Vipa Home experiments. These unethical experiments were conducted on mentally disabled patients in Sweden between 1945 and 1955. The experiments aimed to study the effects of sugar on dental health. This was initiated by the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare to investigate sugar consumption and its effects on teeth. The study took place at Vipholm Mental Institution in Lund, Sweden, and test subjects were the institutionalized residents of Vipholm, many of whom had mental disabilities. They were vulnerable, they couldn't provide informed consent. The subjects would be divided into two groups, with one group being given unrestricted access to sugary foods and candies, while the other were given controlled amounts. The aim was to observe the progression of dental cavities in these groups. Excessive amounts of sugary foods were given to some of the patients, far beyond what would be considered normal or healthy. Surprisingly, this led to severe dental problems. The researchers were deliberately inflicting harm on vulnerable people and what makes this whole thing even sadder is that the results of the experiment weren't even released until years later because of how bad it looked on the confectionery industry who were actually helping financing this. So this led to some to believe that the researchers were bought off just to keep quiet. It wasn't until the 90s where the cruel nature of these experiments finally came to light, being condemned by the public. Number five, attack of the dead men. The attack of the dead men refers to a military engagement that occurred during World War I on August 6th, 1915. There was a Russian stronghold located near the town of Oswick in the Eastern Front. It was a key defensive position for the Russians against German advances. The German army, as part of the wider Central Powers offensive on the Eastern Front, attacked the fortress, aiming to break through the Russian defenses. During the battle, the Germans employed chlorine gas, a chemical weapon to weaken the Russian defenses. The gas was intended to incapacitate or unalive the soldiers defending the fortress. Now, despite being affected by this gas, some Russian soldiers driven by pure desperation and with cloths or handkerchiefs soaked in water covering their faces counterattacked the advancing German forces. The gas masks available at the time were not effective against chlorine gas and the sight of Russian soldiers appearing with their faces covered in white cloths and just blood stained from the effects of the gas it gave rise to this legend of the dead men. They basically looked like zombies rising up and moving towards the enemy. And the fierceness of the counterattack, combined with the horrifying appearance of these Russian soldiers caused complete terror among the German troops. They fled and they're still being attacked from behind. Many of them died, you know, getting trapped in their own traps and stuff. Germans believed they were facing the spirits of the dead, panicked and abandoned their on the fortress. Really cool story. Number four, an often overlooked dark historical event is the forced sterilization programs that took place in the United States. Hard to believe this actually took place, but it did beginning in the early 1900s up until the 70s, if you can believe that. Several states implemented eugenics programs aiming to control the population and improve the genetic quality of society. One of the methods used was forced sterilization, targeting individuals considered unfit for reproduction. The victims of these programs were often people deemed socially undesirable, people with mental illnesses, disabilities, and individuals from marginalized communities, African and Native Americans primarily. It's estimated that tens of thousands of people were forcibly sterilized under these state-sanctioned programs. The exact number are difficult to determine because of poor record keeping and the fact that these procedures were kind of swept under the rug. Number three, the Great Molasses Flood. On January 15th, 1919, a massive storage tank containing 2.3 million gallons of molasses collapsed in the North End neighborhood of Boston, Massachusetts. The Great Molasses Flood, also known as the Boston Molasses Disaster, resulted in widespread destruction and loss of life. The tank had been poorly constructed with weak rivets and insufficient safety measures. At around 12.30 p.m., the tank suddenly burst 
first, releasing a wave of molasses, estimated to be about 25 feet high, moving at a speed of 35 miles per hour. The molasses wave engulfed the neighborhood, causing significant damage to buildings and streets and the Boston Elevated Railway. The disaster resulted in 21 people losing their lives and around 150 others being injured. The tank had been filled to capacity just two days before, and the increased pressure probably contributed to this collapse. The disappearance of the USS Cyclops. So the USS Cyclops was a United States Navy cargo ship that mysteriously disappeared during World War I. The ship was used primarily for transporting coal and was one of the Navy's largest fuel ships at the time. In March of 1918, during World War I, the USS Cyclops departed from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil and made stops in Barbados and the Virgin Islands. Its final destination was Baltimore. The ship never reached its destination though. It vanished without a trace along its route, disappearing in the infamous Bermuda Triangle. No wreckage or survivors were ever found. Various theories have been proposed as to why the ship vanished. Could have been from a storm, structural failure, or an enemy attack, but none have been proven. The disappearance of this ship resulted in the loss of 309 crew members and passengers, making it one of the largest non-combat losses of life in US naval history. And finally, we're going to finish things off with a bizarre one, with the trial of a corpse. This happened in January of 897 AD, several months after the death of Pope Formosus. After Formosus died, his body was exhumed and he was put on trial. Not before he died, after. The trial was orchestrated by Pope Stephen VI or VII, there's some debate on that, but he was, really just wasn't a fan of Formosus. Stephen accused Formosus of perjury, violating church laws, and of being an illegitimate pope. During the trial, Formosus' seventh-month-old rotting corpse was dressed up and placed on a throne. A deacon was appointed to act as his advocate, answering questions on behalf of the dead pope. Formosus was found guilty on all charges. His papacy was declared invalid and his acts as pope were declared invalid. Three fingers on his right hand, which he had used for blessings, were then severed and his remains were thrown into a river. After Pope Stephen VI's death, Pope Theodore II annulled the whole trial and restored Formosus' honors and good name. He called the trial a travesty, declaring the verdict null and void. Starting off this countdown, we have experimental electrical stimulation. Taken in 1856, this photo shows a man undergoing an experiment with electrical stimulation. And by the looks of it, it was quite painful. So back then, they would use the stimulation for a number of reasons. One, to manipulate an experiment on one's nervous system, and two, to treat certain diseases and disorders. Nowadays, this treatment is much safer. They use it to help with injured muscles or manipulate nerves to reduce pain. But back then, they were still trying to get it right. So it makes you wonder how many people underwent these painful experiments and how many people were accidentally killed before they found the correct voltage to use. In our ninth spot today, we have the lipstick killer. William George Herons was an American criminal and potential serial confessed to be the lipstick killer. The lipstick killer was someone who took the lives of a number of women and would often leave a creepy message at the scene of the crime in lipstick. That's how he got the name, Lipstick Killer. The photo I'm about to share with you was a creepy message that he left at the scene of one of his crimes in 1945. He wrote, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Now this message is creepy for a number of reasons. First, you got a man on the loose who can't control his impulses and he just admitted it. And second, look how creepy it just looks with the lipstick smeared everywhere and such. It took the police six more months from the time this message was written to finally catch William. This photo is just a scary and dark reminder of the horrors this man committed. Moving on to number eight, we have the poverty. This photo from 1948 shows just how bad poverty was in the 1940s to 50s in America. This is when the poverty rate was at its highest. In this photo, Mr. and Miss Ray Shalafo were facing eviction from their Chicago apartment. They were so desperate for money that they had to sell their kids. Now this photo was a stage photo, but it still shows a heartbroken mother not knowing what else to do. Within two years, all four kids 
were sold into different homes. It also sheds the light on how different laws were back then. Nowadays, that is very much illegal to do. Anyways, this is a very heartbreaking photo. Like, I can't imagine what that family went through. Moving on to number seven, we have the nuclear shadow. On August 6, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The bomb was so powerful that people up to a mile of it were vaporized. All that was left of them was their shadows burnt into stone. This is a creepy image that shows one of the bomb's victims. It's a silhouette of an elderly man or woman with a cane. So the bomb's light and heat were so powerful that it bleached any exposed surfaces. In this case, the person's body shielded that part on the sidewalk, and that's why an imprint was left there. All around Hiroshima, there were multiple of these body outlines. It's very disturbing and sad. It just shows their final moments alive. In our sixth spot today, we have the Stanford Prison Experiment. The Stanford Prison Experiment set out to explore the psychological effects of imprisonment. It started on August 14, 1971. A university psychology professor gathered a bunch of student volunteers and divided them into groups. 11 were assigned the role of guards and 10 were assigned the role of prisoners. It's going to be a two week experiment where the volunteers would play their part in a make believe prison. But the experiment had to be ended after only six days. The volunteers got way into character. Some guards turned sadistic. They really exercised their power over the prisoners. Whereas many prisoners became depressed and showed signs of extreme stress. The study and this creepy photo provide a chilling look at what humans are capable of. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the wild man suit. Not only is this a dark photo from history, but it's also a very mysterious one. This suit that you're seeing is what historians named the wild man suit. It consists of a double layered set of armor covered in one inch long iron nails. What was it used for you may ask? Well, no one knows for sure. One popular theory is that it was used during bear hunting in the 1800s. Or it was used in bear baiting. Don't know if that's true, but it looks very uncomfortable to wear. Maybe it was a twisted torture device. The executioner would wear it and then give the prisoner a nice big and tight hug. I don't know, I'm just guessing, but either way it's messed up. In our fourth spot today we have the ruins of Hiroshima. Here is another very scary and sad photo taken after America dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. The bomb had an explosive yield equal to 15,000 tons of TNT. In fact, it destroyed five square miles of the city. This photo shows the ruins of the once beautiful city. Buildings and wildlife were completely destroyed by this bomb. In fact, the US remains to be the only country to ever use an atomic bomb in war. It had a huge lasting impact on the city that we should never forget about. In our third spot today, we have the Titanic. On April 15, 1912, the infamous ship the Titanic began to sink. 1,500 passengers sank with the ship after it hit an iceberg during its maiden voyage. The few that did manage to survive fled on lifeboats. This is a picture of the last lifeboat approaching the rescue ship. You can see it was crammed with passengers as all the lifeboats were. This photo serves as a reminder of this great tragedy in history and all the innocent individuals that were impacted by this disaster. In our second spot today, we have the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. In 1906, San Francisco was hit with a massive 7.9 magnitude earthquake. It has since garnered the title of the most powerful earthquake in Northern Californian history. This earthquake not only caused homes to come crumbling down, but it also started a number of fires throughout the city. Hundreds of fires started as a result of the broken gas lines. These fires went on for three days, engulfing 500 city blocks. More than 3,000 people passed away from the earthquake and fires. 20,000 buildings were destroyed and 200,000 citizens were left homeless. It was very sad and tragic. This is a photo from this devastating time. This was after all the damage was done. People lined the streets and just stared at the destruction that the earthquake caused. And in our number one spot today, we have the American Buffalo. Now this photo is absolutely heartbreaking. This was taken in 1892 Michigan, and that is an actual mountain made up of buffalo skulls. That means thousands of buffaloes were slaughtered. No wonder why the buffalo population is considered near threatened and are at risk for extinction. So these skulls were then ground down to be used in making bone china or refining sugar and producing fertilizer. It's said that around the end of the 18th century, there were between 30 to 60 million buffaloes on the continent. When this photo was taken, the population was at only 456. They literally slaughtered millions of buffalo. What makes it worse is that some of the buffalo were killed purposely just so that the indigenous individuals were deprived of them. Number 10, Tomas de Torquemada. Ever heard of the Spanish Inquisition? Well, this guy was 
one of its star killers. Not only do we wish it never happened in the first place, it did, so we might as well talk about it and learn from it. But we can't discuss the Inquisition without mentioning Tomas, who was responsible for thousands of deaths. He gave people two choices. Either join the Catholic Church or die, which led to thousands of Jewish and Islamic people being exiled from Spain. He played the role of inquisitor and was in charge of investigating and punishing heretics. He oversaw the burning of thousands of innocent people, as Tomas often used cruel methods of extracting confessions from people he believed to be heretics. He seemed to almost enjoy his job hanging, burning, suffocating, and tormenting people with the rack and waterboarding. No one knows exactly how many people died during the Inquisition, but historians estimate anywhere between 30,000 to 300,000. Pretty, pretty wide gap there. Number nine, Caligula. Man, his name is too fun to say. Too bad he wasn't a fun guy. It's better I tell you now that essentially this list is a depiction of what happens when the wrong people get their hands on power. From 37 AD to 41 AD, Caligula ruled as if he was some kind of mad god that needed to be satisfied. Not only did his addiction to gambling cause a nightmare for the economy, he seemed to delight in suffering. In the first three months of his rule, he made his people sacrifice 160,000 animals in his name. When he first took over as ruler, people actually liked him though. He made helpful political reforms and recalled exiles, but most people blame his future tyranny on a brain fever that befell him later on. He blew money on lavish projects, some still helpful like aqueducts, to building a two mile long floating bridge across the Bay of Bali so he could ride his horse across it day after day. He even ordered his men to attack the sea by collecting shells with their helmets. His lascivious love affairs included copulating with the wives of his allies and even allegedly his own sisters. Caligula's reign was equal parts terrifying and embarrassing, which is probably why his officers stabbed him to death. Number eight, Leopold II of Belgium. During the height of colonialism, Leopold of Belgium wanted to make his mark by conquering the African Congo. As soon as I said colonialism, you know, you know where things are going, so get ready. He made it his property and instead of, you know, being a good human being, he decided to establish a dictatorship instead. He made the rest of Europe think that he was acting as a good guy, so they'd give him money, then proceeded to hire mercenaries. These mercenaries were set with the task of draining as much money from the state by enforcing free labor camps. Anyone who disobeyed or failed to meet demands were severely punished and even had their limbs removed. Leopold was responsible for the deaths of 20% of the population and thankfully was stopped before he could do more damage. Roger Casement, after doing a little digging, released a report which detailed the horrors he had committed under the guise of philanthropy. He was forced to surrender the Congo, though it was considered a part of Belgium until the 1950s. <sighs> Whew, buckle up folks, it only gets worse from here. It's number seven and we're already at Genghis Khan. Get ready. Genghis Khan, ruler of the Mongolian Empire, killed so many people. He changed the carbon footprint of the earth. In one single battle, he killed over 1.2 million people. Though this sounds like an exaggeration, I don't find it hard to believe, since he just left the corpses to rot, the battlefields became oily and whole mounds of, like mountains of bodies formed. Genghis Khan was supposedly responsible for over 40 million deaths. If you need a number to compare that to, that's the same amount of people who died in World War I altogether. He also enjoyed in excess the spoils of war, brutalizing women and assaulting them. In addition to that, he held mass beauty contests and all those who didn't win would be given to his soldiers like objects. Mm. Because of that, around 16 million people are said to be descendants of him today. That's how many people he... Yeah. Many people blame his brutal and ruthless upbringing as Khan very much had to raise himself under the mentality to kill or be killed. He even killed his own brother at age 10 just for not sharing food. He was also horrendous when it came to tormenting his betrayers. Some ways include pouring molten silver down their throats and sawing people in half while they were still alive. Oh, and he killed 75% of the population of Iran and tried to commit an entire genocide. Yeah, the list goes on, but so does this list and there is more to come, so. Let's go. Number five, Idi Amin. General Idi Amin staged a coup on January 25th, 1971 and forced Uganda's first prime minister, Milton Obo, into exile. From there, he created a reign of terror that abused Uganda's freedom after more than 70 years of British rule. Amin organized mass 
thousands of Akoli and Lango Christian tribes who were loyal to Obo. He terrorized his own country with internal security forces whose main purpose was to eliminate those who opposed him. His brutality also resulted in the collapse of the economy. This man just seemed like he just didn't have a single good bone in his body. He was also rumored to have eaten human flesh and his vicious and inhumane rule resulted in the death of 300,000 civilians. Eventually Amin was forced to flee and sought refuge in Saudi Arabia, though he was never punished for his crimes and died in 2003 due to organ failure. So he got away with it, essentially. Number four, Pol Pot. Hmm. You'd think a leader's job would be to protect and serve their country with love and respect, but I guess Pol Pot didn't see it that way. Originally named Salah Sar, Pot was the leader of the Khmer Rouge totalitarian regime during 1975 to 79 in Cambodia, though technically longer. It was a radical communist government who caused the death of more than 2 million people through forced labor, starvation, disease, torment, persecution, and. He wanted to purify society and wanted to extinguish capitalism, western culture, city life, religion, and all foreign influences in order to form a pure communist regime. All media outlets along with embassies and external medical help were refused and essentially he barricaded Cambodia into their own little world. Education was halted, healthcare eliminated, it was crazy. The people were forced into slave labor on the killing fields, only allowed 180 grams of rice a day. Deadly purges were conducted to eliminate remnants of the old society including monks, police, doctors, lawyers, teachers, ex-soldiers along with their families and former government officials. His cruelty and madness knew no bounds. It took years for him to finally be put under house arrest by his peers and was never truly punished for his crimes against humanity. He died of a heart attack in 1998 following his arrest. So yeah. And we're reaching our top three. <laughs> I bet you thought, I bet you thought number three was going to be number one. Nope, there were worse people than him. Number one spot, Mao Zedong. Ready? I don't think anyone can be. Mao Zedong during 1966 to 1976 turned China into a house of fear by eradicating 65 million people. In his attempt for a socialist China, he killed anyone that got in his way, kind of like Stalin, through and mass starvation. His biggest threat was the intellect. And revered Emperor Shi Huang, who buried 460 scholars and sought to surpass him by burying alive 46,000 scholars. Yeah, my stomach turned when I read that. That's awful. He coined his operation the Great Leap Forward. To combat rising resistance, he created the Red Army, composed of girls and boys from the ages of 14 to 21, to roam cities and target enemies of the state, especially their teachers. He would make the teachers wear dunce hats, cover their faces with ink, and make them crawl on all fours and bark like dogs. He also expanded a system of a thousand forced labor camps. Most amazing fam, I could go on, but I honestly don't have room. It just seems like there's no end to all the awful things that he did. For all these reasons and more, Mao is of course in our number one spot. Coming in at number 10 is Parallel Universe. A group of NASA scientists working on an experiment in Antarctica have detected evidence of a parallel universe where the rules of physics are opposite of our own, according to a report. A cosmic ray detection experiment has found particles that could be from a parallel realm that was also born in the Big Bang. Now, the expert used a giant balloon to carry NASA's Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna, or ANITA, high above Antarctica. Antarctica, where the frigid dry air provided the perfect environment with little to no radio noise to distort its findings. Now, a constant wind of high energy particles constantly arrives on Earth from outer space. That means the high energy particles can only be detected coming down from space, but the team Zanita detected heavier particles, so called tow neurotinos, which come up out of the Earth. Now, the finding implies that these particles are actually traveling backward in time, suggesting evidence of a pair parallel universe. The simplest explanation for the phenomenon is that at the moment of the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, two universes were formed, ours and the one that from our perspective is running in reverse with time going backwards. We're left with the most exciting or most boring possibilities, said Ibrahim Safa, who worked on the experiment. Number 9. 
nine million year old DNA. In the fall of 2022, scientists announced that they uncovered million year old DNA just north of the continent of Antarctica. Yeah, a million years old. Now, scientists actually accidentally collected the unusual genetic samples up to 584 feet beneath the seafloor as part of a 2019 survey led by the International Ocean Discovery Program in the Scotia Sea north of mainland Antarctica. The ancient sediment that was discovered is now the oldest marine DNA found from seafloor sediments. The team looked closely at damaged patterns within the recovered DNA fragments to establish exactly how old they were. Now, the oldest fragments clocked in at around 1 million years old. Now until now the oldest CETA DNA which was found locked inside arctic permafrost dated to around 650,000 years ago. Now this DNA will be analyzed and studied by scientists as it will tell us a lot about the polar marine ecosystem as well as how climate change may affect Antarctica. Number 8. Earthquake Swarms A series of earthquakes was recently discovered all the way in Antarctica, the southernmost continent. Now scientists discovered earthquake swarms occurred along the Shetland Plate and the Antarctic Plate. Now the swarms lasted from August 2020 all the way through February 2021. Within that time, around 85,000 earthquakes occurred, which is insane and low-key scary. Scientists believe this series of earthquake storms were caused by the eruption of a dormant volcano. Now the swarm occurred around the Orca Seamount, an inactive volcano that rises 2,950 feet from the seafloor in the Bransfield Strait. Now the two largest earthquakes in the series were a magnitude of 5.9 quake in October 2020 and a magnitude 6.0 quake in November. Number 7. Colossal Squid Expedition An international expedition of scientists conducted a colossal squid exploration in December 2022 and were able to grab videos and photos of some of the rare species swimming far beneath the surface. Now, This type of squid is the largest intervertebrate in the world and this expedition could reveal important information about the behaviors and habits of the colossal squids as well as information on animal life in Antarctica in general. Now, This species was first discovered in 1925. So the goal of the scientists was to capture footage of this majestic creature before the 100 year anniversary of its discovery. Now while this discovery in Antarctica is still underway, there is much more we can learn about these creatures. Number 6. Meteorite In January this year, on an excursion to the icy plains of Antarctica, an international team of researchers discovered five new meteorites, including one of the largest ever found on the continent. Now, The rare meteorite is about the size of a cantaloupe, but weighs a hefty 17 pounds. The specimen is one of only about 100 that size or larger discovered in Antarctica, a prime meteorite hunting location where more than 45,000 space rocks have been tracked down. Now, the exceptional find is heading to the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences in Brussels, where it can be studied. Maria Valdez, a research scientist at Chicago's Field Museum of Natural History and the University of Chicago, who is part of the expedition team, has kept some of the material for her own analysis. She'll take her samples and use strong acids to dissolve them before a process called calibrated chemistry to isolate various elements that make up the rock. Then I can start to think about the origin of this rock, how it evolved over time, what kind of parent body it came from, and where in the solar system the parent body formed, she said. These are the kind of big questions that we try to address. Number 5. Strange Creatures In 2021, geologist James Smith of the British Antarctic Survey drilled through an Antarctic ice shelf to sample sediment which was locked under half a mile of ice. To get to it, James and his colleagues had to melt 20 tons of snow to create 20,000 liters of hot water, which they then pumped through a pipe lowered down a borehole. Next, they lowered an instrument to collect the sediment along with a GoPro camera. Later that night in his tent, James watched the footage and he found a rock 4,000 1,600 feet under the surface. Now it was the wrong place for collecting seafloor muck, but the absolute right place for a one in a million shot of finding life in an environment that scientists didn't think could support that much of it. A layer of bacteria known as microbial mat was on the rock. An alien-like sponge and other stocked animals dangled from the rock, while stoder cylindrical sponges hugged at the surface. The rock was also lined with wispy filaments, perhaps a component of the bacterial mat, or perhaps a particular animal known as a hydroid. Now whatever the case, this was an extraordinary find that they will be continuing to study. 
Number four, deepest point mapped. A new map of the Southern Ocean gave scientists their most detailed view to date of the seafloor surrounding Antarctica, including its deepest point, the Factorian Deep. Resting at a depth of around 24,400 feet below sea surface, or 17 Empire State buildings stacked top to bottom, the Factorian Deep was only discovered in 2019. But until now, researchers had no idea how it fit together with the surrounding seafloor. The new map draws from more than 1,200 sonar data sets collected mostly by science vessels and covers more than 18.5 million square miles of the seafloor. Researchers hope to use the sea bottom chart to identify underwater mountains or seamounts that might be hot spots for marine life. Number three, Blood Falls. In the McMurdo Dry Valley, a bright crimson five-story waterfall pours out of Taylor Glacier into Lake Bonnie. It looks like a gush of blood from a wound in the ice, but scientists have recently discovered the cause behind this mysterious phenomenon. The water that feeds Blood Falls was once a salty lake that is now cut off from the atmosphere due to the formation of glaciers on top of the lake. Now the water is preserved 400 meters underground and has become even saltier over time. It's now three times saltier than seawater and cannot freeze. The salt water is also extremely rich in iron and completely devoid of oxygen and sunlight. As the iron rich water seeps through a fissure in the glacier and comes to contact with the air, the iron oxidizes and rusts, staining the water a dark red color. Now just looking at this freaks me out, but I'm glad scientists were able to discover the reason behind it. Number two, singing ice. It appears that a massive slab of ice in Antarctica is singing. The Ross Ice Shelf is the largest ice shelf in Antarctica. It's several hundred meters thick and covers an area of over 500,000 square kilometers, around the size of France. Scientists have recently discovered that the Ross Ice Shelf sings an eerie melody caused by the winds blowing across the snow dunes. The winds create surface vibrations and almost non-stop seismic tones. Now the vibrations aren't audible to human ears Years, and scientists use seismic sensors to hear the tune. Now, the song was actually discovered by accident after seismic sensors were installed on the ice shelf to observe other behaviors. Now, scientists have since discovered that the song changes in response to the environment, such as melting or storms shifting the snow. They're now using the song as a tool to monitor the ice shelf in real time, tracking its stability and vulnerability for collapse through the seismic humming. And coming in number one is Secret Lakes. It's difficult to imagine any beneath the thick layers of ice in Antarctica, yet scientists have discovered a number of underground lakes. First uncovered in 1970 with radars, there are estimated to be around 400 lakes sitting under 3 kilometers of ice. Scientists believe the lakes were formed after the separation of Antarctica from Gondwanaland, the ancient supercontinent. Lake Vostok, discovered in the 1990s by Russian scientists, is the largest subglacial lake in Antarctica. In 2014, scientists had a major breakthrough at Lake Wallace discovering a diverse and active ecosystem of microorganisms in the lake, nearly a kilometer under an ice sheet. Then in 2022, researchers discovered a city-sized lake hidden deep underneath the East Antarctic ice sheet. The hidden lake, which was named Lake Snow Eagle, has a surface area of 143 square miles and lies in a mile-deep canyon beneath two miles of ice. The team uncovered the lake following three years of exhaustive aerial surveys over the ice sheet using radar and special centers designed to measure minuscule changes in Earth's gravity. Now, experts believe it can contain 34 million year old river sediments that are older than the ice sheet itself and could shed light on what Antarctica was like before the continent froze. And we're starting things off with Jeronique Cunningham and Cleveland Jackson. On January 3rd of 2002, Jeronique Cunningham and his half brother Cleveland Jackson committed a violent crime in Lima, Ohio. They took the lives of Grant and year old Lanisha Williams. The victims, along with six others, were present at the house of a man targeted by Cunningham and Jackson for a robbery involving and money. Following the robbery, Cunningham and Jackson opened fire on everyone inside the house. Tragically, Jala died while her father held her in his arms. Cunningham and Jackson also attempted to take the lives of the survivors, each of whom sustained gunshot injuries during the incident. Both Cunningham and Jackson were convicted, with Jackson receiving a death sentence. Cunningham is currently serving a life sentence. Next on the list is George Wagner IV. In April of 2016 in Pike County, Ohio, a gruesome incident took place, now known as the Pike County 
Eight members of the Roden family were tragically taken from life in four separate homes. The victims included seven adults and a year-old all shot to death. In November of 2018, authorities arrested George Wagner III, his wife, Angela Wagner, and their two sons, George Wagner IV and Edward Wagner Jr. In connection with the crimes, the family was accused of meticulously planning and executing these attacks. Their motive was believed to be centered around custody, financial disputes, and an illegal growing operation. Next up, we have Michael Madison. So Michael Madison, born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1977, was convicted in 2016 for the deaths of three young women in East Cleveland, Ohio. Between 2012 and 2013, he took the lives of his victims, whose remains were discovered in various locations near his residence. Madison's arrest in 2013 followed the discovery of the first victim's body wrapped in plastic in a garage. Neighbors had noticed a foul odor coming from his property and authorities were alerted. Their investigations continued and this led to the identification of two additional victims. Police found the remains of the second victim in a weeded lot and the third victim's body was found in a nearby abandoned house in the basement. During his trial, Madison actually smirked causing a father of one of the victims to lunge at him in anger. Luckily, that man was released without charges. Madison was found guilty of multiple charges, including aggravated murder and kidnapping. In 2016, he was sentenced to death for his crimes. Next up on the list is Donald Hoffman. Donald Hoffman was convicted of taking the lives of four men over the Labor Day weekend in 2015. He was sentenced to four consecutive life terms. The victims, Freeland Hensley, 67, Gerald Smith, 65, Billy Jack Chapman, 55, and Daryl Lewis, 65, were residents of Bucharest, Ohio. Hoffman admitted to his crimes, stating he committed the acts to fund his addiction. And during the slangs, Hoffman used various methods of violence. He beat Hansley with a frying pan, strangled Smith with an electrical cord, struck Smith in the head with a bottle, strangled Lewis with shoelaces, and attacked Chapman with a pry bar. Hoffman stole the victim's debit and credit cards, spending over $2,100 on drugs and cigarettes. Prosecutor revealed that Hoffman specifically targeted older men with health issues whom he knew personally. Number six, the Downtown Posse. During the Christmas season of 1992, the Downtown Posse, led by Marvelous Keen, embarked on a brutal crime spree in Dayton, Ohio. Their first victim was Joseph Wilkerson, a 34-year-old General Motors worker. The gang lured their way into his home where Wilkinson was shot. The gang then partied in his house for the next three days while he lay dead in a bedroom. On the same night, they took the life of 18-year-old Danita Golette, who was uh, using a payphone. She was robbed of her belongings and lost her life despite pleading not to be harmed and cooperating as best as she could with them. The following day, the body of 19-year-old Richard Maddox, a former boyfriend of one of the gang members, was discovered. Jeffrey Wright was also shot but survived his attack, having received multiple wounds. Continuing their violent spree, the gang shot Sarah Abraham year old mother working in a family business. Abraham succumbed to her injuries five days later. On December 26th, former Dayton Police Sergeant John Huber spotted a stolen car connected to the group. He arrested them, not yet aware of their involvement in everything else that had been going on. After their arrest, Laura Taylor, one of the members of the downtown posse, confessed to two more victims, the bodies of Wendy Cottrell and Marvin Washington, who were found uh, in a gravel pit. Taylor revealed they took them out because the gang believed they might inform the police about their crimes. Marvelous Keen, the gang's leader, confessed and was sentenced to death, with his sentence being carried out back in 2009. The other three members received life prison sentences. Next on the list is Edward Edwards, which is just the dumbest name I've ever heard. Just laziness on his parents' behalf, but that's all this guy really deserved. Born in 1933, Edwards' criminal activities started at a young age with burglaries and frauds. He was arrested multiple times over the years for various offenses, including arson, robbery. In 1961, he was convicted of arson and spent several years in prison. After being released, though, Edwards took the lives of several 
several people, including his own adopted son. He took the lives of two different couples in the 70s, and in 1992, he ended the life of his adoptive son, Donnie Boy Edwards, committing the crime for financial gain in order to collect his $250,000 life insurance policy. Edwards' crimes went undetected for uh, many years, allowing him to continue his criminal activities, but in 2009, he was finally apprehended and charged with crimes he committed decades earlier. He was linked to the crimes through advancements in uh, forensic technology and DNA evidence. Ariel Castro. Castro was born in Puerto Rico, but he moved to Cleveland, Ohio with his mother when he was young, and this is where he would grow up to commit his crimes. Castro was responsible for the abduction and imprisonment of three women, Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Gina de Jesus. These three women were held captive in Castro's home for about 10 years. That is crazy. One of the victims, Amanda Berry, even gave birth to her daughter during this time. They were subjected to physical and emotional torment, which included being kept in restraints, confined to a few rooms in the house. Amanda Berry managed to escape from Castro's home in May of 2013, though. Castro had left the home for the day, and she managed to catch a glimpse of his neighbors through a screen door. She screamed for help and managed to make contact with them. All three women were luckily rescued, as well as Barry's daughter. Castro was arrested shortly after the escape. In 2013, he was charged with multiple counts. To avoid the possibility of facing the death penalty, he later pleaded guilty to the charges. And in August 2013, Castro was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And, you know, just because why not? He got an additional thousand years in prison. So, yeah, safe to say he's not getting released anytime soon. Next up, we have Robert Bardella. Now, this guy died in 1992, so a return is highly unlikely, but he's gotta be one of the worst criminals in Ohio's history, right up there with Dahmer, possibly even worse. He was born in Ohio in 1949, but his crimes were carried out in Kansas City between 1984 and 87. He was responsible for the deaths of at least six men. Bardella lured his victims, often vulnerable young men, to his home with promise of money or shelter, and once in his captivity, he subjected them to prolonged periods of sadistic torment. He would hold them in captivity, sometimes for as long as six weeks at a time before disposing of them. His crime spree came to an end, in 1988, though, when one of his victims managed to escape and alert the police. The bodies of his former victims were never found, unfortunately, but police did find journals and uh, Bordello had written chronicling his crimes, as well as photographs and personal belongings of the victims. Bordello was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. He died in prison in 1992 due to a heart attack. Finally, we have Sean Great, eventually being sentenced to death for his crimes, having taken the life of five young women. His last victim, whose real name has been kept secret, uh, known to the public simply as Jane Doe, had met Great at the Ashland Salvation Army, Ray and Joan Crock Corps Community Center. She viewed their relationship as purely platonic and would consistently reject his advances, but Great managed to lure her to his home using the ruse of offering her some clothes he claimed to have for her. Once inside though, his personality completely flipped and he attacked her. She ended up being held captive for three whole days. But there's a light at the end of this tunnel. She managed to find an opportunity to secretly contact the police while Great was asleep. This led to his arrest and the end of her nightmare. And during the legal proceedings that followed, Great was found guilty of his crimes. He's currently sitting on death row. And we are kicking things off with the 3,000 year old arrow. This is a super recent discovery. It just happened back in September. A glacial archaeologist named Espen Finstad was hiking through the Jotunheim Mountains in eastern Norway when he came across a wooden arrow. It was so well preserved that to the naked eye, it would probably look brand new. It even still had feathers on it. But Finstad estimated that this arrow was actually around 3,000 years old. He later determined it was likely used by a hunter in the late Stone Age to early Bronze Age. Finstad stated, what makes the arrow so impressive is its preservation. Though it is broken into three parts, the arrow remains attached to the shaft, as do the feathers, known as fletchings. 
which helped to stabilize the arrow's flight path. So this is just one of the many artifacts turning up uh, once frozen under you know thick layers of ice. You know, not just in Norway, but in cold climates all around the world as glaciers continue to melt. At number nine, we have Mummy Juanita. Mummy Juanita, also known as the Ice Maiden or Lady of Ampato, is an exceptionally well-preserved mummy of an Inca girl which was discovered in 1995. The mummy was found on Mount Ampato, a dormant volcano in the Andes Mountains of southern Peru, by anthropologist Johann Reinhard and his team. Mummy Juanita is believed to have lived during the Inca Empire, making her one of the best preserved ancient bodies ever found. She was approximately 12 to 14 years old at the time of her death. The mummy was found at an altitude of about 20,600 feet, and her discovery was kind of accidental. Reinhard and his team were actually on a mission to recover another Inca mummy when they stumbled on her in a crevice. She was wrapped in several layers of colorful textiles and buried with various offerings, including ceramic and metal objects, food items, and small statues. She's probably sacrificed as an offering to the Inca gods. The mummy is currently on display in the Catholic University of Santa Maria's Museum of Andean Sanctuaries in Peru. Uh, you know, so get over there immediately. Tap on her glass encasing and uh, tell her Uncle James said hello. First person in the comments to do that will receive a, a wink emoji from me and a $10 gift certificate to Walden Books. Number eight, the mammoth mummy. No, this is not a giant sized human mummy. That would be pretty awesome. This is pretty awesome too, but it's, it's a mummified woolly mammoth. In 2010, a team of Russian scientists found a well-preserved mammoth in Siberia, later named Yuka. She was a young mammoth, about six to eight years old, and lived around 39,000 years ago. Yuka's body, was in really good shape. Its body measured about two and a half meters in length, and it was remarkably intact with her trunk, bones, some of her flesh, hair, and even eyes still preserved, making her one of the most well-preserved mammoth specimens ever found. It's pretty incredible to see, not that I've ever seen it uh, in person, but based on pictures and video that I have seen of it, uh, crazy how well-preserved it is. Finding a dinosaur in this condition would be absolutely unreal. Anyway, they think she might have fallen into a mud pit or drowned, which helped to uh, preserve her so well. People probably butchered her for meat as there were cut marks on her bones. Scientists studied her DNA to learn more about mammoths and their connection to modern elephants. Right now, Yuka is currently being held in Moscow. Next up, we have the Greenland Norse textiles. Uh, these textiles are a collection of ancient fragments discovered in 1921 in various archaeological sites in Greenland. The textiles provided insights into the types of clothing and weaving techniques of the Norse settlers who lived in Greenland during the medieval period. The sites where these fabrics were found are part of the remnants of Norse settlements in Greenland, which thrived between the 10th and 15th centuries. Fabrics discovered include include woolen garments and household items. They were remarkably well preserved due to the cold and dry climate of Greenland, which helped prevent decay. The textiles had a bunch of different weaving patterns, colors, and designs that reflected the skill and artistry of the Norse weavers back in the day. It's interesting to see what their clothing looked like beyond depictions of them in ancient artwork. These fabrics uh, have also been useful in understanding the challenges faced by the Norse settlers in Greenland and how they adapted to the harsh environment. And at number six, we have the Kostenki 17 artifacts. The Kostenki 17 artifacts were discovered at the Kostenki site in Russia, an archaeological site known for its wealth of Upper Paleolithic finds. The artifacts discovered at the site include bone and antler tools, bone ornaments, and various artifacts made from organic materials. Archaeologists dug up a number of bone and antler tools, like spear points, knives, and needles tools that had been crafted with remarkable precision. They also found ornaments made from bone like beads and pendants. On top of that, there were plenty of hunting tools like projectile points along with bones of animals that they had hunted. Some other notable discoveries at the site were engraved objects and fragments. These engravings often depict animals in geometric uh, patterns, showcasing the type of artwork they would have made at the time. At our number five spot, we have the Siberian Ice Maiden, also known as the Princess of Ukok or the Altai Princess. 
This is a mummy of a young woman that was discovered in 1993 in the Ukok Plateau, the Altai Mountains in Siberia. The Siberian Ice Maiden was discovered by Russian archaeologist Natalia Polosmak in a tomb on the Ukok Plateau. The site was located in an altitude about 8,200 feet. The mummy is believed to date back to around 500 BC, making her approximately 2,500 years old. The mummy was found in a wooden sarcophagus covered with felt blankets and a cowhide rug. She was dressed in intricately woven garments made of wool and felt that was also adorned with jewelry, you know, earrings and necklace, various ornaments made of gold and other precious metal. So it's likely she held a high social status within the community. Her burial seemed to have been part of a complex ritual too, which led the archaeologists to believe she could have been a priestess or a noblewoman. Number four, the Etherican brown bear. 2019, scientists uh, made a pretty cool discovery in Siberia. A thousands year old brown bear carcass preserved in the permafrost. The ancient brown bear carcass was discovered by reindeer herders. It was incredibly well preserved because of the permafrost conditions which prevented decay. The carcass dates back approximately 3,500 years, placing it in the late Bronze Age. This age estimation was made through radiocarbon dating, a technique used to determine the age of organic materials based on their content of carbon-14 isotopes. Next on the list is Quede Dan Shinichi, which which was the name given to a remarkably well-preserved body discovered the Tachanshini Alaska Provincial Park in British Columbia, Canada. Quede Dan Shinichi was discovered by hunters in the remote wilderness northwestern British Columbia. The body was found partially buried in the ice, surrounded by a variety of artifacts. He was believed to have lived over 550 years ago, around the early 15th century, a member of one of the indigenous tribes that inhabited the region during that time. The body's preservation was due to the glacier ice, which acted as a natural freezer, protecting the remains from decomposition. And along with the body, again, a variety of artifacts were discovered. There was a robe made from animal hides, a spruce root hat, a woven mat, a walking stick, various tools made from stone and bone. The body was then ceremonially reburied in 2000, following traditional rituals and protocols. Coming in at number two, we have the Landbrein tunic. In 2011, during archaeological excavations in Landbrein, Norway, this ancient piece of clothing was discovered. The tunic was a remarkable archaeological find, revealing more information about ancient Norse clothing and textile techniques. The Landbrein site in the mountains of Norway was once frequented by travelers during the Roman Iron Age, approximately 300 to 500 AD. Because of the ice and snow in the region, many artifacts including textiles have been incredibly well preserved and the tunic it's made of wool dates back to around 230 AD. It's a tunic style garment with a natural brown color, a simple design. It has a twill weave, a pattern commonly used in textiles in that era. Just think of how much of our clothing, by the way, is going to be left behind after we eventually leave Earth or go extinct, let alone all our other crap. We churn out so much stuff on a constant basis, more so than at any point in history. I think finding stuff from this era is going to be so common in the future that it'll be more of a new rather than a remarkable find. Finally though, taking that number one spot is Otzi the Iceman. Now, why is this number one? I don't know, not really any particular ranking going on here, just uh, a good one to close off with. In September of 1991, hikers Helmut and Erika Simon stumbled upon a well-preserved human corpse high in the Alps near the border of Austria and Italy. Later known as Otzi the Iceman, the two hikers saw the remains and actually thought he could have died relatively recently. But no, Otzi was an ancient human who had lived over 5,000 years ago during the late Neolithic period. He was so well preserved because he'd been encased in ice for that thousands and thousands of years. His body was found in the Otzel Alps. The discovery site was in the Schnalzalval Sinalis Valley, a region that was once covered by glaciers completely. Scientists discovered that Otzi lived between 3359 and 3105 BCE, making him one of the oldest and most well-preserved naturally mummified humans 
ever found. He was five foot five and weighed around 110 pounds. The age at the time of his death was estimated to be around 45 years old. Besides his body, researchers also found a bunch of artifacts and clothing items with him a copper axe, a quiver of arrows, a bearskin cap, and a coat made of woven grass and hide. Otzi's remains and belongings are currently housed in the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology in Balzano, Italy. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Heraclitus of Ephesus. Heraclitus of Ephesus was an ancient Greek philosopher who helped push the notion that the universe is in constant change, as well as the unity of opposites, where the universe is a system of balanced exchanges. This is all fine and well, but where things get troublesome is in his own personal life. Heraclitus was a misanthrope, and his dislike for humankind led him to having long stretches where he was quite isolated. He would wander through the wilderness alone, surviving on plants and other things that he could scavenge. In the end, he came down with a pretty terrible and painful illness called dropsy, which is an accumulation of fluid underneath the skin. Doctors were unfortunately unable to help him, so he took matters into his own hands. He decided to cover himself in cow dung under the belief that as it dried, it would draw the moisture out from under his skin. This could have been a genius idea, albeit super gross, but things took a very, very dark turn. Covered in the dung, he laid out in the sun to dry, but the dung created a body cast and it left him unable to move. This inability to move also left him unable to shoo off the pack of wild dogs that ended up surrounding him. So, unfortunately, he was eaten alive. I guess I can understand why this one may have just been left out of history class. In our number nine spot today, we have Kurt Gödel. The Austrian-American philosopher and mathematician Kurt Gödel lived from 1906 to 1978, and he made quite a name for himself. Being compared to the likes of Aristotle and Einstein, he is best known for his incompleteness theorem, which was a very significant mathematical result. He was obviously very successful and found himself teaching and educating a younger generation, but similar to who we just talked about, his personal life is where things got quite dark. When he was six years old, he had a case of rheumatic fever which left him quite ill for the rest of his childhood. This led him to first being pretty preoccupied with his health, and unfortunately this turned into hypochondria, which then led him down a path of complete paranoia. He ended up having an irrational fear of getting poisoned, so to avoid this he would only eat food that had been prepared by his wife, who also had to taste it beforehand. Sadly, his wife was hospitalized in 1977 for six months, which obviously left her unable to prepare food for him. I'm not exactly sure why he couldn't just prepare the food himself, but during this period he refused to eat, which eventually led to him starving to death. In our number eight spot today, we have prohibition poisoning. I'm sure most of us learned about the prohibition at some point in school, which of course was the outlaw of the consumption of alcohol, which was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol by the US government from 1920 to 1933. But it is just as well known that this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming consuming alcohol, it was just done in sneakier ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that is definitely less well known is something that government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. Basically, they poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. And not just poisoned in a way where the drinker would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. In our number seven spot today, we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up knights, imagining that he was St. George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was very obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep from shattering. 
but then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean he was totally abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances bricked up. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number six spot today, we have the Sticky Bomb. Okay. So this one is less of an event and more of just a historical invention that absolutely should not have existed, and that is the sticky bomb. After the British hurriedly evacuated France in 1940, they were facing the threat of German invasion and had to come up with some weapons that could be used against tanks. Thus, the sticky grenade or sticky bomb was born. It was formally called the anti-tank hand grenade number 74, and basically the design was that there was a metal outer shell that covered a bomb coated in adhesive. The idea was to have the user pull a pin to remove the metal casing, where they could then run up to a tank, use the sticky adhesive to stick it to the tank, activate the five second fuse, and get the heck out of there, or you could just throw it and hope it stuck. Well, there's a few problems with this design. The first one being that I'm sure all of us can understand, the adhesive didn't want to stick to anything dusty or wet or muddy, which are all things that happen to be common to tanks. You know what they did like to stick to though? human skin. Unfortunately, this invention could prove much more detrimental to the person who was attempting to use it. Despite these very obvious and dangerous flaws, it was still used by a few different armed forces, but I don't think anyone has used it in recent history, which is truthfully for the best. In our number five spot today, we have Bikini Island. Bikini Island is located within the Marshall Islands, and it once was the home of around 170 islanders. In 1940, the US president at the time, Harry Truman, ordered that the military test their nuclear weapons in the case of a future where they would be deemed necessary since World War II had just ended and people were of course feeling very concerned about what the future would hold. Since Bikini was located in a place where ships and planes didn't normally travel very close to, unfortunately it was the spot chosen for this testing site. The residents of the island were asked to vacate for the good of all mankind and to end all world wars, to which they of course obliged under the impression that they would one day be able to move back. After this, the testing began, and in 1954, the US military detonated Castle Bravo, which is one of the most powerful weapons at 15 megatons. There were 22 other weapons that were detonated on this island as well, so it's safe to say that this place got a ton of nuclear activity, which left it with extremely high levels of radiation. This left residents unable to return for much longer than anticipated, with the first returning in the 70s. But of course, shortly after these poor people moved back, they realized that the island still had had totally unsafe levels of radiation, making it still unfit to live on, which has left it still uninhabited. In our number four spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. During his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At the time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well-known events during his rule was his pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325, and it spanned an estimated 4,000 miles, and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 60,000 of his men, all wearing Persian silk, along with 12,000 slaves who each carried four pounds of gold bars, and he brought heralds who had golden staffs, along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo to the royals to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal in Egypt and it took decades for them to recover. That was kind of just a whole mess. But like we talk about like Napoleon and Alexander the Great and all the things that they did and I've literally never heard of this guy before. And he's like one of the best conquerors, most successful conquerors of all time. 
seems suspicious. In our number three spot today, we have the hostage crisis. In 1980, America saw Ronald Reagan win the presidential election over the former president, Jimmy Carter, but there was a crisis going on that was taking the attention of Americans everywhere. The Iran hostage crisis is well known in American history, and it began on November 4th, 1979, when 52 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage after a group of militarized Iranian college students took over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. The 400 in 44 days these Americans were held hostage is something I'm sure a lot of Americans learned about at some point or another, but the release of the hostages is what sometimes gets a little more murky in the history books. The hostages were released on January 20th, 1981, which was the day that Reagan was inaugurated. There were people who believed that the hostages were released because Reagan was simply just more powerful than Jimmy Carter. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that Reagan received a ton of credit for the release of the hostages, but truthfully, it barely had anything to do with him. The Carter administration had been attempting to negotiate with them for months, but they hated Carter because he had provided aid to the former monarch of Iran and had also failed an attempt to rescue the hostages before. So while they certainly were released on Inauguration Day, it had way less to do with Ronald Reagan and way more to do with them just absolutely hating Jimmy Carter. In our number two spot today, we have internment camps. This is something that might be more well known than I think it is, but in my Canadian education, it wasn't something we talked about at all, which is kind of shocking. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century and the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit, with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of this same kind of atrocity. It is very surprising to me that this is something that isn't discussed more often, as it of course is something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese-American community for decades to come. In our number one spot today, we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievably terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So, like I mentioned before, in 1911, there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day, which is absolutely horrible. After more details came out about the incident and how the terrible working conditions were mostly to blame for the amount of lives that were lost, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like, just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically got off scot-free. If you want to know more about this fateful day, the amazing podcast, My Favorite by Georgia Hardstark and Karen Kilgariff has an episode that does a wonderful job covering it. The episode is number 189 entitled What Wonderful Luck. It is crazy and there's a lot going on. Number 10, the Black Plague speaks for itself, really. I mean, I, I would still take COVID over this any day, but like, huh. The Black Plague was a wave of death and disease that struck fear into any who encountered it. Not only was the time period incredibly ill-equipped to handle it, a miracle we survived. What with basically no knowledge of hygiene whatsoever, it was a painful ordeal. Blood and pus filled boils would emerge, followed by fever, chills, vomiting, violent number twos, and aches and pains, which would inevitably end up in death. People who were perfectly healthy when they went to bed might have ended up dead the next morning. It was that fast. People did everything they could to avoid the sick. Doctors refused to see patients if they did. Their procedures were dangerous and unsanitary. I think what scares me the most about this is the lack of understanding around the disease or disease in general. No one had any idea what was causing it and if you thought isolation was bad, imagine doing that without telephones, iPads, social media, or Skype. You would have no idea what was going on with your family. So um, 
Yeah, definitely the Black Plague. It's up there. Number nine, the King James Witch Hunts. Of course, we have to add some more witch hunts to this list because there were many. And this time, they weren't hanged. They were burned at the stake. Not fun. And this by mere scale was much worse than the Salem Witch Trials. For some reason, King James I of England had something against women. Oh, wait, sorry, I meant witches. 85% of the people accused were women. King James believed that he and his Danish bride had been specifically targeted by witches after encountering a dangerous storm while trying to cross the North Sea, which by the way, is notoriously bad to cross anyways. He believed the storm was conjured and the first he accused was Galus Duncan. Her employer, David Seaton, forced a confession out of her through torment, after which she named several accomplices. Duncan retracted her confession, but it was too late. The witch trials began, and in 1591, Agnes Samson confessed that 200 witches sailed to the church of North Berwick on Halloween night in 1590. There, the devil preached to them, and they began to plot the king's destruction. The convicted witches were burned at the stake, a much more terrifying way to die than by hanging, even though that's still bad, and over 100 were implicated, with many being because how do you disprove something that's not real? Number seven, Pompeii. A massive world ending explosion? Suffocating thousands and covering their corpses with lava sound great to anyone? No, me neither. The fact that people still live in and around Pompeii astounds me. You know it could happen again, right? Right around lunchtime on August 24th, 79 CE, a huge earth-shattering eruption blasted volcanic debris all over the city of Pompeii. Over the next few days, clouds of blistering hot gases swarmed the city, buildings were destroyed, the population was either crushed or suffocated. The city was literally covered in ash and stone for centuries until it was finally unearthed in the 1700s. I visited the city and the stone corpses frozen in whatever position they were in when they died is haunting to say the least. Absolutely terrifying. Mount Vesuvius, the volcano mentioned, sits above at 154 mile deep pit of magma and scientists think it's overdue for an eruption. So yes, I would take the Salem Witch Trials over that any day. Number six, Jack the Ripper. An unknown killer preying on London committing horrendous and brutal acts? Yeah, no thanks. I don't even like doing lists about the serial individuals we have mentioned. I would take a witch over Ted Bundy or Ed Gein any day. Because there is nothing in question there. They are real. Witches? Don't know. But Jack the Ripper remains one of the most terrifying serial killings of history and remains unsolved. In the East End of London in 1888, five gruesome murders place in Whitechapel. Not only were their lives taken, but their corpses were mutilated in nightmarish ways. The crimes had a huge impact on society as a whole up until that point. Crimes such as that had never been so heavily in the press. The name Jack the Ripper became coined after a haunting letter sent to the London News Agency was signed by Jack. This was just one of the letters he sent, one being accompanied by a kidney preserved in wine. Number five, Holodomor. The Holodomor was the first that was meticulously planned out in order to cause the most suffering. The withholding of food was used as a weapon. Between 1932 to 1933, millions, millions of Ukrainians were killed by a man-made famine engineered by Joseph Stalin. Rural farmers made up of 80% of Ukraine's population and they were the primary ones hit. After World War I and the fall of the Russian monarchy, Ukraine established the independent Ukrainian People's Republic in January 1918. They fought the Bolshevik army for three years but eventually fell and was forced to be a part of the Soviet Union. Stalin's vendetta against Ukrainian farmers began when their unrest resulted in a new economic policy that gave them more freedom. Stalin didn't like that. When Stalin at last established his stronghold, he decided to destroy Ukrainian peasantry. Through widespread intimidation arrests, imprisonments, he took out church leaders, Ukrainian intellects, party functionaries, and basically anyone who opposed him. Then in August 1932, he decreed that if anyone, even a was caught taking produce from a collective field, they could be shot or imprisoned. He sealed the borders so no one could leave and they were all forced to starve to death. And finally, it ended in 1933 when Stalin essentially got what he wanted. Number two, Khmer Rouge. Orchestrated by Cambodian leader Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge was one of the most horrific points in history. Much worse than the Salem Witch Trials. It's like, that's nothing compared to this. During 1975 to 79, the totalitarian leader caused the death of over 2 million people through forced labor, starvation, disease, torment, persecution, and blatant. Pot and his radical communist society was trying to 
purify society in order to make capitalism and other Western ideologies disappear. I can't even begin to imagine how terrifying this would be to live through. This is the real 1984. He cut off all media outlets along with communication with embassies, education was stopped, healthcare was eliminated, he basically locked Cambodia off from the rest of the world. He knew that anyone with intellect would threaten his regime so he eliminated anyone who symbolized that, even people who wore glasses, there was the police, doctors, lawyers, teachers, ex-soldiers along with their families, he took all of them out. He forced everyone into what became known as the killing fields and forced them to work off of only 180 grams of rice a day. It took years for his peers to finally have enough of him and lock Pot away under house arrest, but even then he was never really truly punished. Khmer Rouge was finally overthrown by invading Vietnamese troops in 1979, but it was only until the 1990s to the early 2000s after Pot died that prosecutions began. 